spins a web any size. Catch your seeds just like flies. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 18 of Amazing Spider-Man Classics in association with SpiderManCrawlspace.com. With me in the studio tonight are, of course, our usual crowd of Donovan Grant. Hiya, hiya. And Mr. Bertoni. When he calls me Mr. Bertoni, I feel a hundred years old. And joining us this episode is our special guest co-host... From the podcast Clone Saga Chronicles is Spider Fan Gerard Delatour. Thank you for having me, man. And uh, by the way, uh, co host sounds way better than panelist. <laughs> yes. All of my guys are co hosts. Even if you're only a co host for tonight, you're the co host. Yeah, you notice that Clone Saga Chronicles is kind of taking over Amazing Spider Man Classics. You have three of their hosts on your show right now. <laughs> I'm actually sort of looking at the pitchforks y'all are raising in my direction and kind of getting a little scared. Yeah, we don't so need John. <laughs> we don't need John. <laughs> next next episode, Zach will be hosting. And like, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man Classics by Zach. <laughs> okay, uh, we have two um, really good issues of Amazing Spider-Man that we're going to be talking about tonight. Numbers 24 and 25 from 1965. But before we get into that, let's just get to know uh, Gerard a little bit. Uh, tell us, take a few minutes, Gerard. Tell us what all you have going on on the internet out there. Uh, well, I, I review Amazing Spider-Man for the aforementioned Spider-Man Crawl Space, and uh, I'm also reviewing. I, I do some reviews for Zach's website, SpideyDude.com, and uh, right. Unfortunately, the last thing that I'm reviewing is ending Spectacular Spider-Girl, <laughs> and it makes me sad. Aww. Aww. Did, I love did, that. Do you need a minute? Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. Okay. I haven't read the latest Spider-Girl yet. I'm, I'm, when, once I get caught up on Spider-Man, I'll go back and tackle all the Spider-Girls. Gerard, how about you go on to the new Aranya podcast? <laughs> uh, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was all happy. I was like, oh, I'm going to review something good in, in this episode. None of those crappy like modern ASMs. And then, and then you had to bring up Aranya Girl and piss me off. Thanks a lot. <laughs> now I'm gonna be now I'm gonna be really angry this episode. Thanks. You, if I start spewing profanity that has to get bleeped out, blame blame Josh. Okay. <laughs> We're all giving you a look now, Josh. <laughs> so Gerard, how uh, how did you get into comics uh, in general, and then in, into Spider Man in particular? Well, I, my my comics origin story, as it were, is actually kind of something that you'd never encounter today because it, well, you'll see in a second. I, it was in the early '90s. And the the X Men cartoon was on the air. Oh yeah. And so my my oldest sister took us to a a paper store in a campground, believe it or not. And we we went to the rack where they have the newspapers and they had some comic books there. And she told it was me and my other sister. She said each of us pick one out. So I grabbed um, X Men Adventures number six, which if you don't remember that series, it was basically adapting. It was adaptations of episodes of the cartoon but with like a slightly different twist to it. And, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of like got into that comic. So then the next time we were actually in a supermarket, again, another place you can't buy comics nowadays, and uh, we, the first Spider-Man comic I ever bought was there. It was Amazing Spider-Man number 383, and I've pretty much been reading ever since. I pretty much stuck to the supermarkets for a long time until I got back to high school, and then from then on I haven't missed an issue, I think. 383, I'm trying to think. I started with 341. I'm trying yep. to remember if I was still re- still reading at 383. Was that before or after Maximum Carnage? That was a little less than a year after Maximum Carnage. It was actually um, part one of Trial by Jury. Now, if, I, if you guys remember that, that's the one where Spider-Man gets put on trial by the jury. Well, <laughs> that's, that's a really, really bad joke. Um, the, the, there's that group of the super armored guys, the jury, who are... <laughs> For fight- taking the Venom symbiote to Earth. <laughs> Yeah, they they put him on trial for bringing the Venom symbiote back to Earth and causing all the death that Venom and Carnage have caused. So they they pinned him for that basically, and then they, it was three issues <laughs> they put him on trial for that. It was actually a, a Maximum Carnage callback, so of course it was after. I, I think Maximum Carnage was in ASM three seventy three, so it was less than a year. Okay, yeah, I was thinking three eighty three was after I'd finished, but I know that Maximum Carnage was my cutoff point. So That's matter. such a stupid concept. That would be like, hey, you gave a serial killer a ride across the state line once, so you're responsible for every single person he's killed. I know. What, what, yeah. what, what, what loony logic? It was, it, it was a 
a bad comic, but Bagley. So you know. And yeah. At, and at the same time, I, I can kind of see someone having that idea for a comic. It, it, it could be done well. I'm not saying it was, but it, it might could be done. Wasn't it the last time Bagley drew a Trial of Spider-Man comic? <laughs> <laughs> was there another one in the clone saga or when did he do oh yeah okay. a really bad one <laughs> yeah. Kane, is a, Kane is a defense attorney uh, Carnage is a prosecutor I think Carnage is really? like Carnage is talking to himself on the witness stand he's like and how does and, and, and then who was that man and then Carnage like jumps to the witness stand it was him over there and then jumps out and like he's kind of like doing the dual roles thing it's yeah. that sounds really stupid it, so it's, somehow it's even worse in execution than it was in theory. <laughs> you can hear it sounding stupid on Close Like a Chronicles podcast. Exactly. Like, well, now that we're all dumber for having heard that. No, just kidding. <laughs> well, well, cool. Um, so it sounds like you got into Spider Man just a little bit after I did, but I watched that X Men cartoon. That was on. That was that was good stuff. Yeah, Spider Man wasn't on yet, but it. I, I think when did it, the Spider Man animated series start? Like February. Of, yeah. So not long after. We have emails we're going to read here today, starting with one from Eric Gentry. Don, you have that one? I do. Hi, guys. Good show today. It was funny to hear myself mentioned so many times. <laughs> anyway, I have included the scans of the epilogue to the story. I did read the recent annual that dealt with Captain Spidey's first meeting, and I remember thinking that it could work continuity-wise, but I read it pretty late, so who knows. I will let you guys examine it, because I don't have the annual here in my apartment. Yes, it's currently in storage with all my other back issues, but don't feel bad for me because I have this problem where I buy on average 15 to 20 new comics a week, so I have plenty on my plate. As for the Clone Saga Chronicles, I have episodes downloaded, but I haven't gotten around to listening just yet. The last issue I read in my Spider-Man reading project was Spectacular Spider-Man 229, where Peter lets Ben take over, so it's a good temporary stopping point. I know what happens generally, but I haven't actually read all the Clone Saga issues before, so I didn't want to spoil myself before I finished reading the Clone Era books. Silly, I know. Anyway, keep up the good work on the podcast. I'll try to interject more interesting tidbits here and there. Regards, Eric. Thank you, Eric, for the scans. Yeah, he does. He did include um, scans of the 10-page backup story that followed up on Avengers number 11. So uh, I was flipping through some of it, and I saw Captain America kind of berating Spider-Man a little bit for uh, inexperience, but we'll see how that goes. Right, right. But yeah, we appreciate the uh, email, Eric, and do continue to write in with other thoughts that you have. And we have another one here from Steve Rogers, frequent writer. Spidey memorabilia in the 1960s. Hey, gang. Dropping in. Well, first I wanted to kind of shake my head at Steve Ditko's refusal to appear on the MMMS's recording. Granted, it was hokey, corny, silly, and all that. But Steve Ditko did know who Marvel's target audience was, right? But then again, Ditko always was, and still is, a loon. I wonder if we should feel bad for making fun of him so much. Probably more out there than Alan Moore when you think about it. I mean, hearing some of the things he said about the whole commercialism aspect of comic books and superheroes almost wants me to put Ditko in league with a certain Holden Caulfield-loving entertainer-murderer. I refuse to utter that person's name, but you know who I'm referring to. What the hell? No, I know who he's referring to. He's referring to the guy that killed John Lennon, and it's... That's a very bad comparison. Because Steve Ditko doesn't kill people? Yeah, no. Typically, no. comparing, like, Steve Ditko, like, you know, being a a nutty guy to, like, you know, the guy that killed John Lennon, which is, like, a very sore subject among Beatles fans because the guy that did it, like, literally admitted that he only did it for attention. Ditko's a nutty guy, but if if you're going to compare him to the person that you're comparing him to, you're comparing somebody who helped co-create one of the most big, pop culture icons in the world to somebody who destroyed one of the biggest pop culture icons in the world. You, you can't, you can't make that comparison. I feel a little uncomfortable putting extreme, well, not even extreme, but you know, unique political philosophies in the same league as a murderer. Yeah. But you know, Steve, I I try not, don't try not to be so dark next time. (laughs) He does go on to say, which again brings up the point of, hey, you do realize what you were doing and whom you were doing it for, right? So are you – I I guess I'm just not really certain what your comparison is here because you have a man who worked for the comic book industry and worked for the superheroes who now has gone on to be kind of critical of that industry to somebody who killed Killed a a person. There's no (laughs) – Yeah, there's There's no no comparison. comparison. 
Sorry, Steve, we're going to have to leave you cold on that one. But um, he does go on to say, speaking of commercialization of comic book characters, I thought it might be fun to see what officially licensed stuff you could have gotten back in the day. Granted, you are just starting 1965 as I type this, but I'm going to see if I can cover the entire decade. Courtesy of Hake's Guide to Character Toys 6th Edition featuring a Spidey Radio, probably 1978, hey, that might mean JR from the Crawl Space must have had one by Amico on the cover, from 2006. Well, this is disappointing. The guide only has a handful of stuff from the 1960s and doesn't even list the 1967 Captain Action Spider-Man. I shall investigate further on Spidey's merchandise in the 60s. In the meantime, this is what it says in the guide. 1966, a model kit made by Aurora that is worth $450 near mint in box, in between $35 and $165 in loose and built condition. And finally, the book lists a Spidey button that will be worth $65 if near mint and in bag. Loose anywhere from 10 bucks to 30 bucks, a Mark's Toys metal bike attachment plate from 1967, and a 1960s vending machine aluminum ring. Very Wait, odd. What? A, vi- a vending machine aluminum ring? Like, like part of a vending machine? Or, or part of um, part of an old style can where the uh, the pull ring was a different design. Oh, uh, uh, that's interesting. He, but he makes a good he makes a good point. He says very odd. I know there is tons of stuff out there. I wonder what criteria is used in this guide. I've also received the impression that there were tons of Spider Man type things you could buy by the end of the sixties because there was actually I remember I recall at least reading one letter where a letter writer complained about. Basically, to put it bluntly, how much Marvel is whoring themselves out to the merchandising. So I don't know. You ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) His last sentence says, oh, well, I'll do some more research on this and see what else is out there. Yeah, I mean, it'd be kind of cool to see what kind of Spidey stuff is out there, especially with, you know, pictures or at least web links or something. So we can see more than just a description. But thank you for the emails. Please send some more. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> so that being done and said and out of the way, let's get on to our spider books. We have our first one tonight is Amazing Spider Man number twenty four, which was released on February eleventh, nineteen sixty five, with the cover date of May. And covering that for us will be our guest this month, Mr. Gerard Delatour. Yay! Hooray! Applause, applause, please. Please you settle down. Settle down. Um, Jump out a window! (laughs) (laughs) Hey, hey, don't go there. Amazing Spider-Man number 24, Spider-Man Goes Mad. In this issue, we have a mighty script by Stan Lee, powerful art by Steve Ditko, and a lot of lettering by Sam Rosen. Lily just like S. Rosen. Like, the the, the last few issues, he's been S. Rosen. They don't, like... I don't think he's ever been Sam Rosen. He's sometimes Sam Rosen. Is he afraid, like that, like people like are gonna mob him in the streets? <laughs> he's afraid that the light breakers he owes he's, he owes money to are gonna find him in comic books. Is it? Do you think it's like Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, but we're not gonna give him the you know the benefit of a first name that starts with S like the rest Stan, of us have? Stan, Steve, and S. Stan, Steve, and Sam. I don't know. It's the S Club. You know, Stan, Steve, and Sam all working on Spider Man. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> if, you had a, if, if you had a lisp, that would be the hardest sentence to say. <laughs> he does have a lisp, dude. Don't make fun of him. Assume, first of all, we gotta assume you can get past that acid trip of a cover, which is <laughs> Spider-Man walking up a wall. Or no, he's on the ceiling actually, which is kind of sideways, and they've got. It's hard to explain. Just look it up, people. <clears throat> so we start at the suburban home of Peter and his aunt May, and a delivery man arrives with a hat for May, which Peter. It barely manages to pay for it with money out of the cookie jar. And so determined to earn some cash, he puts on his costume and heads out. But, you know, to his dismay, unfortunately, things are a lot quieter than he expected. And so eventually, after sort of trolling around a little bit, he finds some really overly dressed burglars in, like, suits and, like, bowler hats and stuff. And so he sets up his automatic camera across the street and proceeds to just lay a smack down on the punks. Just as he's finishing up, Frederick Foswell arrives on the scene, which for some reason, causes Spider-Man to just completely flee in dismay and run up the side of the building. <laughs> so he, figured, he, he figures now, since Fe- Foswell saw him there, that he figured his photos were useless because Foswell realized that Peter Parker wasn't there. So he decides to just rip the film out of his camera, which, I, I gotta be really honest with you guys, it looks like a really long condom, the way it's drawn. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a line of film. He said, well, what else am I going to do today? Oh, I know. And he pulls out the condom. <laughs> I'll go see Betty. 
Or <laughs> something or, of a spider. Or, actually, or Liz, it doesn't matter. <laughs> actually, it's funny you say that, because the next thing he does is, he says, since he's in the neighborhood, he'll go by the Daily Bugle to see Betty. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and in a series of Three Stooges like uh, physical comedy, he discovers that Betty has in fact been corresponding regularly with Ned Leeds while he's stationed in Europe on his assignment. And rather hypocritically, this causes them to just get angry and sort of sulk off. Sulk off. That just sounds terrible. Whoa, 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 whoa. How's this hypocritical? <laughs> I think you know how it's hypocritical. Well, he, well, he does. He does. No, say, no, no. Uh, it ain't hypocritical on Peter's part because Betty's the one who's like, "How dare you?" You know, like sit in the same cafeteria with Liz Allen at lunch. She goes to my school. You must never talk to another girl ever. Now, excuse me while I go date Ned Leeds. <laughs> and he's finally reacting to it, like after all this. Yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I mean, he should be mad. <laughs> Meanwhile, Foswell sort of delivers the news of the little story that he had to Jameson. And then suddenly he gets a great idea, quote-unquote, that's his words, not mine, to publish this anti-Spider-Man commentary from other, you know, citizens of New York and other people. So he sends out some reporters to gather this biased commentary on his instruction, and they sort of they record only negative opinions of the wall crawler, which is witnessed by, of course, Flash Thompson, who, by the way, is everywhere in this issue. <laughs> you could build a little drinking game around Flash Thompson randomly appearing places. But only um, if you're above 21. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and remember, please drink responsibly. Flash sort of... Accost- never, never, never web swing on the influence. <laughs> Flash sort of accosts the reporter and then manages to, afterwards, witness Peter talking to Liz Allen, who's asking Peter for help with her science studies. Then, after one of the fastest newspaper printings in recorded history, New Yorkers are suddenly reading Jameson's impartial opinion piece. Oh. And this is this, this little scene with them all talking kind of reminds me of like internet fandom in action. It's like, I never thought Amazing 639 was so bad, but everybody else does. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> you have a point there. <laughs> so we cut back to the Daily Bugle, where J Cubed is basking in the afterglow of his victory, I guess, with a cigar when Dr. Ludwig Reinhardt arrives and details the history <laughs> of Spider-Man's damaged theory, I'm sorry, on Spider-Man's damaged psyche, including the impending danger it would cause if it was untreated. The next day, Reinhardt's theory is printed in the Daily Bugle, and after Peter reads the article, he calls Betty to pump her for information. There's a phrase. <laughs> Wouldn't she be pumping him? <laughs> Sorry, I got, I got lost in my notes. That was not intended to be a hanging. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I can turn everything inappropriate. It's what I do. No, please, go ahead. <laughs> insert, insert wacky sound effects into that little... Uh, yeah, all right. Betty was too busy pumping Ned Leeds. <laughs> For, for information. For information. And Flash, and Flash Thompson and Ben Riley. <laughs> Did oh, she do Ben Riley too? Riley. Yeah, she, yeah, she, <laughs> had a, she had a romance with him twice. Once is the Scarlet Spider. They did like a Superman the 1978 movie takeoff where like he's in the garden and like, can you read my mind? Good and then song. towards the end of the Clone Saga, they dated as like Ben Riley and Betty Brandt. My mom's telling me no, but my body. My body said me yes. Really? Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> it's much it's much weirder with the actual music. So Peter hangs up suddenly and decides to run off to find Reinhardt, and he's sort of tailed by Flash, who again just coincidentally happens to be walking around outside of Peter's house, who believes that <laughs> Peter's having a secret dalliance of some sort with Liv, so he starts <laughs> following him around. Using some clever thinking, a web line and a spider signal, Peter distracts Flash and heads for the Daily Bugle as Spider-Man. It, it was literally just, you know, ooh, look, there's something, there's a wall, thing shining on the wall over there, it's Spider-Man! And then, in that amount of time, I guess Flash can get away. We mentioned uh, this, like, in an earlier episode, we talked about how it was going to happen, but it's just hilarious, because it's like, throws the spider signal on the wall, ooh, look, something shiny, it's Spider-Man! And that is not the last time uh, of this episode that you'll, you'll see somebody fascinated by the spider signal. It's like, the spider signal! I better go! It's a good thing Peter <laughs> retrieves it, because he says, glad I didn't forget to grab my spider beam, beam again. So remember, Peter went back and retrieved his spider beam. Oh, he I went know back and he this. got it. <laughs> he retrieved his spider beam. He makes a point of saying it. You know, no, no reason why I'm mentioning this, just, you know. Is that in this uh, issue that happens? <laughs> he said it's on the same page. He said, oh, "Glad, I didn't, yeah, glad I didn't forget to grab my spider beam again." Okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, you go along. You can almost hear them cocking that Chekhov gun. But anyway, 
<laughs> well, that's 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 my favorite line of the episode so far. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only ten minutes in. Suddenly, as he changes into Spider-Man, he's attacked by Doctor Octopus, who then immediately vanishes for some reason. After a similar attack by the Sandman, Spidey begins to worry that, in fact, Reinhardt's theory is coming true, that he's losing his sanity. After another similar attack from the Vulture, he heads home and changes back into his civvies. He looks in the mirror, passing by in the bathroom, and notices that he has a very pale complexion, and when he hears his Aunt May calling him, decides to run off before she can actually see him. His face on what? that page is just, like, ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> By, by the way, if I had an aunt that was prone to having heart attacks and fainting spells, I wouldn't constantly just keep running away without saying anything. That that would probably rile her up a little bit. If this uh, was a sitcom, like, Aunt May would walk in with, like, a bug mask or something, and he'd be like, oh, I'm tripping. She's like, oh, this is Ferrana Watson's costume party. <laughs> Dressing as Spidey again, he heads to Ludwig Reinhardt's home address, which makes no sense, considering he said that he's on vacation in New York. He actually has a home there, apparently. After being let inside... <laughs> oh, yes. I don't, even, I don't even got that. Good catch. After being left let inside by this automatic door opening system thing that he has, Spider-Man just starts completely tripping balls, and he decides to listen to what Reinhardt's telling him about, you know, <laughs> sitting down and being analyzed and all that stuff. So. so back at the offices of New York's finest daily newspaper, Foswell arrives to inform Jameson of some important news regarding Reinhardt, which we're, we're sort of in the perspective of Betty Brant sitting nearby her, so she doesn't actually hear what it is. But she sees Jameson angrily run out to see Reinhardt immediately. Getting out of a cab at Reinhardt's address, Jameson is accosted by, you guessed it, Flash Thompson, dun, dun, dun. Ha- happens to be there again for the third time in this story. <laughs> they burst in, and just as Reinhardt is about to convince Spidey to give up his costumed identity, Jameson and Flash burst into the office where Jameson exposes Reinhardt as a fraud. Reinhardt attempts to escape, but of course Spider-Man stops him and reveals that he is in fact Quentin Beck, a.k.a. Mysterio, although I guess he's not called Beck in the story because I-, I guess yeah, he hadn't no. actually... There is no it. Quentin Beck yet. It's not until 1983 that he gets a name. Yeah, exactly. So he, he has no origin at this point. So he rips off his mask and then just calls him Mysterio repeatedly. So Which is kind of funny if you think about it. It's like, you know, Mysterio is not a name. It's, it's a moniker. And so yeah. he should be calling him. He should be calling him, you know, Simon or Quentin or whatever his name is at this point. But he's not. Simon. <laughs> yeah. So after Spidey leaves... Mysterio gives the obligatory explanation that everybody has to give whenever their plans are foiled, and reveals to Jameson that he was, in fact, moments away from having Spider-Man unmasked to flash of the light and to Jameson's chagrin. In fact, Jameson gives this really epic face palm when he's, when he's here. <laughs> so after back in at Forest Hill, Peter meets with Liz, and after a brief stopover to see Aunt May and, and to point out to her that he is not, in fact, crazy, constantly running out of the door, Heads to Liz's house for some <clears throat> studying science, <laughs> and that's where the issue ends. What science, a cliffhanger! <laughs> but notice yeah, that in the Liz. little um, in the little cast of characters thing, that last panel, Liz is nowhere to be found. Well, she's okay. she's like walking with Peter, but like she was replaced by Aunt May. And, you know, stay tuned for uh, Flash Thompson, Betty Brant, and Aunt May, and all all your other favorites. Like, Aunt May's anything <laughs> worth a damn. Oh, she, she's scheming in that second to last panel, though. She's like, at last, I'm making progress, at last. I finally Phase have six is all of myself. <laughs> hey, man, if you, if you think that's scheming, what about that line she has in the first panel of the next comic, or the first page of the <laughs> next issue? Oh, I know. Like, she's like, she's going to become a supervillain. <laughs> <laughs> Heck, didn't she work with, like, not the Sinister Six, but it was, like, the Deadly Foes of Spider-Man or something um, in that Civil War tie-in? Yeah. Did she really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Liz. Yeah, she was working with the Deadly Foe because she was, like, mad at... I mean, they had little Normie hostage, but they didn't have to really twist her arm because she was pretty mad at Peter. She, like, invited Peter over for the pretense of, like, coffee or to talk about Normie being kidnapped or something. They had Willow the Wisp, the Molten Man, and uh, Jack-O-Lantern, I think. Yeah, this is back when um, Peter uh, was unmasked, so, like, and Liz was, like, giving him grief, like, oh, you know, all the death that you brought into my life, Peter, you know, Harry and everything, and it's like... I don't remember that at all. I read those books. I thought I read <laughs> that, that, all the Spider-Man. That's because of the mind wipe and the mental. Because <laughs> <laughs> Liz, does, Liz doesn't remember it either. Going back to the beginning here. Okay, so yeah, psychedelic cover. I really like that cover. I think it's awesome. Oh yeah, like the, pers- the perspective is great because he is he is on the ceiling, but it's skewed, so it looks like he's like 
it, it's hard. It's really hard to tell. He's just, he's just upside down. Yeah, it looks like it's on the wall, and then yeah, Reinhardt's above him on the ceiling. It, it's just really very sixties. This is you know one of the more sixties you know stylized kind of things that it, they've it's done. Very Willy Wonka, you know, uh, boat ride. Spider Man goes <laughs> mad. <laughs> There's no yeah. way of knowing. <laughs> Did he want to be slow? No, I forget how it goes, but yeah. Are the fires of hell growing? Well, we are surely nowhere from slowing. And they start screaming at people. Ah! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> that was a crazy part of that movie. We're, we're, we're 1965, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is before, like, you know, the Beatles were doing most of that, like, trippy stuff. The Beatles were still doing, like, help and everything. They weren't doing, well, turn off your mind and tune in yet. Well, they'd only been <laughs> in the States for a year at this point. Well, okay, when you say they were in, it wasn't like they moved to the States. No, not they, they were only popular. Right. right. When I was doing our year in review last time, I, I noticed that the first, I was going to say CD, just like I always say email and the letters call them, but the first album of the Beatles was released at the beginning of 1964 in America. So yeah, but they didn't actually move here. Of course, why am I telling you about Beatles stuff? I know, no, so like, who are you You're talking about? Wow. Yeah, this is very interesting. So we finally found out the source of um, the Parker's money problems. Aunt May is spending ridiculous amounts of money on these hats for tea parties. I know! It's like, it's a new hat she ordered for a tea party. She scrimps and saves. I don't know about you guys, but in Casa de Wilson, scrimping and saving does not mean buying comics and ordering that new trade or the latest Green Lantern t-shirt. You don't do that if you're hurt for, hurting up for money. She's like, it's like a Bleeding Gums Murphy in the Fabergé eggs. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the sec- it's the secret shame. I'll well, tell you what like- I had enough. There, there's like a subplot like with Aunt May that got like put on the cutting room floor. Like she has to have the new hat for like Anna Watson's party, or like she'll be just so embarrassed because like her rival, you know, like Aunt Agatha, who's gonna show up there, like always has the <laughs> fancy hats and is always showing up Aunt May, you know. So this time Aunt May's gonna show her. And Peter tells him she shouldn't order it, and she's like, "But you didn't see Mary Jane like I asked you to." <laughs> okay, you fine. Say- I won't order the hat if you have dinner. If you come to the tea party and meet Mary Jane. <laughs> and another non sequitur is on the same page. He says he's been busy studying for weeks, so there's been no spidey action. And then I've never seen the city so quiet, not even a jaywalker. So all those weeks that you were, you know, studying and not being Spider-Man were the villains running free and you just ignored them? Or <laughs> Everybody's dead. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> it's a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> the, the lizard and, and scorpion went on a rampage. Everybody's dead. <laughs> Jameson mentions to Foswell, he's like, Spider-Man is the one who sent you to jail months ago. How do you feel about him now? Um, no, the police sent Foswell to jail. The big man yeah, got away from Spider-Man. He's like, he was outside the window, just like, well, Foswell was the big man? Who would have thought? I guess it's in character for Jameson to blame Spider-Man on that, though, even though Spider-Man didn't do it. Right. Him saying something that's not true about Spider-Man would definitely not be something we would expect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of Foswell, uh, we didn't really mention it last time, but this is his big return. We, uh, he got written off as a villain who got taken to jail, and now he's back and going straight. He does yeah. straight with a mustache. And there's kind of that, like, ticking time bomb. Is he really a villain or is he not a villain? Is he the – I mean, he was a Green Goblin suspect for a little while, which makes no sense because they said that the Green Goblin someone that Spider-Man hasn't seen before. Except that like, how many times has Stan Lee written something that, you know, maybe he went back on later? Yeah, where do they say that he's, some, he's somebody that, no, that Peter's never seen before? Where, where, was, where was that in? Issue 17. Whenever um, Peter's in the crowd of kids and suddenly his spider sense goes off and there's a narration point that why would Spider-Man expect this man reading the newspaper because he's never seen the Green Goblin without his mask before. Oh, okay. okay all right. But it's a minor – I can see how somebody might gloss over that thinking that they have the answer. Okay, I have a so, question. Peter finally after all these years gets mad at Betty for uh, you know talking to, talking to Ned on the side. Why does he like run away? I mean you think he would like confront her – I know, I know it's convenient for the plot in the 60s and everything, but logically, he's like, hey, okay, Betty, enough enough stuff. What's the deal with you and Ned? You know, I thought you were with me. He's like, you know, well, fine. If you want to, like, he's like a kid. If you want to do it with Ned, I'll just leave you alone with your letters and your pen. <laughs> well, has, hasn't that ever happened to you guys, like, in real life? Like, you get into a, not, not, not just your girlfriend, but with, like, a fight with anybody, and instead of confronting them, sometimes you're just so angry you walk off for a while. 
Yeah, pretty that well. That may be yeah. true. <laughs> Gerard? That, 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 <laughs> Gerard? That's more yeah. beneficial than killing somebody. Bone Saga Chronicles? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I have no idea what you mean. What do you mean? Well, Peter's been We've always been about... very good friends. We're, we're always on good speaking terms, like right now. Pe- so... Peter's been listening not May too much, because the very next panel, he says... He's like he's trying to justify this Betty thing. He's like, "Oh, we're not engaged," which is what Aunt May's been saying to him. Like, "Oh, like Mary the, Jane, you and Betty aren't engaged." It's like the cap on the really funny scene. It's like, you know, what's wrong with me? What do I care who Betty writes to? We're not engaged. There's so many there's, things. There's a lot of there's a lot of like free sex subtext uh, subtext in this thing. Because it's like, "Oh, we're not engaged. We can see whoever we want, even though we get mad when someone else is with someone else." Well, the, the funny thing is that the flip side of that is that Peter must think that if they were engaged. He would have the right to close off all communications with her from other people that were perfectly okay. <laughs> well, we don't know what those like letters are. Like, if Peter would have opened that letter, I'd, like a Polaroid of Ned, like at a I'm, nude beach, would have come out. And Ned, Ned, Ned on a bearskin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Betty, thank you for thank you for, thank you for your pictures. It's kept me warm in Russia. Wow. No, no, no. You say you say, you say it's in Europe, so yeah, nude beaches or, or whatever. <laughs> I, look what's in Europe. Look what James has sent me to cover. Ho ho. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we don't know what they're writing to. But okay, yeah, because like we've said in the past, Betty like will get mad if Peter has any interaction with Dory Evans or Liz Allen. But like, okay, like if Betty found a letter in Peter's desk from Liz Allen, she do you think herself. that she she would lose her? She yeah, she would lose her stuff. <laughs> she really would. I mean, Peter. Is it is this is this more of like a gender thing that Stan Lee is writing because it's like Peter says in the earlier issue it's not fair of me to you know judge on who are, who are you see anyone you want but then it, I mean they are they are really going out but Betty freaks out every time Peter's like like seriously now like she obviously she freaks out every time Peter even like looks across at a, at the way of another girl but she sees Ned like very very openly I mean yeah she's kind of hiding the letters but. She's really kind of free about that. Is this some some kind of like sixties weird gender thing going on, or is it just like weird writing? Weird. I like Peter <laughs> saying, "Why should I be angry?" And like in my mind, like the, the end of that sense would have been, "Why should I be angry? You hypocritical." <laughs> <laughs> and then Betty's all surprised. I've never heard that tone in your voice before. She. That's like the third time she said that to him. How many times was Peter? <laughs> she said that in like issue fifteen. Like the first time Mysterio showed up, I th- no issue thirteen. Issue thirteen. Go back and read issue thirteen. That's like, Mysterio's- like right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Go open up right now because Betty says that. It's <laughs> lazy. Every time Mysterio shows up, Betty hears like a new tone in Peter's voice or something. I've never heard <laughs> you think. St- it's like the Simpsons joke where Marge says, "This is the worst thing you've ever done," and Homer is like, "You you said that so many times, it's lost all meaning." Pay- page five. You, you never spoke to me that way before. How many ways does Peter have to speak to? Speaking of Mysterio maybe raises his and, voice like, all the time. And, and tropes that happen when Mysterio shows up, this is the second time that Mysterio's used the Daily Bugle. It's like every, you know, you know I what I mean? Say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he used the Daily Bugle in issue 13, you know, for his plan. He's in, I mean, he's nothing if not consistent. I mean, you well, that's because like, Jameson's a gullible SOB. We'll buy, like, like in the next issue, we'll, the, we will prove that Jameson will do anything to. Like discredit Spider Man. He'll, he'll like join. He'll be a Satanist to join to hate Spider Man. And speaking of you know Doctor Reinhardt, do you get the feeling that Steve and Stan or one or the other or both uh, didn't think very highly of pop psychology? That he just kind of. I think I think Stan I didn't. There's a line in here where that really kind of like I'm I'm trying to put to it. There's a line in here that uh yeah it's just it's just so like kind of like stock and like you know. Con- contrived how he says, I'm on vacation here from Europe as a psychiatrist. I'm very interested. Like, it kind of seems like it was really like a, not really done trying to do any realistic sort of psychologist to me. Then, but- he gra- then he grabs Betty and like tongues her and says, that's from Ned Leeds. He asked me to pass that message along for me when I saw him <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> you, you know, when I, Reinhardt to me comes across as, you know, you know how Stan has a lot of like pseudoscience kind of stuff because he doesn't really know like physics and chemistry and all that. I felt like Lute, like Reinhardt was kind of some of that. Like he, he, Stan is not like a psychology major or anything like that. So he pulls out just like the really low level stuff and then just throws it out there. I don't know if it's so much parody as that's just the level to which he could write that stuff at this point. Does Reinhardt keep the same basic look 
whenever he shows up again. I know he comes back in, our, in the issues leading up to 200. I know that for a fact because I read Mar- it. In Wolfman's run, Mysterio uses the uh, Ludwig Reinhardt alias again, and Peter is oblivious to it. Right. He, uh, but, but he, he just said, how, how can I not remember this name? Yeah, he, he, he was in a funk at the time because, like, there was so much going on. And, um, hold on. Let, let me pull up issue 190, 196 because I believe Reinhardt shows him, like, Aunt May's Out of your ass. <laughs> I was just yeah. wondering, uh, wondering if he, he looks basically the same or, or if uh, – He's who? Quentin back. Does he I look mean, like he Quentin Beck in that in that portion? He looks exactly like Quentin Beck, but he, you know, Peter's calling him Reinhardt, but he's not even wearing the Reinhardt disguise. I mean, he's well. It's also he, because at the time Peter thought that Quentin Beck had died in jail, right? Yes, that's right. Because 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 uh, Mysterio died in the first Clone Saga off off panel. Because he Peter was fighting Mysterio the whole issue, and at the end he goes to Betty and Ned, who at that point there's no more shenanigans between the three of them for now and he's like oh i just, I just, I, I just saw spider-man fight mysterio and then like betty and ned deliver the exposition but peter mysterio's been dead for months dun 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 it was like dan um a, a new is like daniel some some daniel sorry. burkhart Daniel Burkhart, yeah. He does it for no reason, basically. Like, Mysterio was my cellmate. Now, when he died, he gave me all the, the equipment to become Mysterio. And I'll try this, but it fails. Like, there's really no reason for him to do that, but he does. But, yeah, I mean, he. Um, I'm looking. Lewid Rygaard is basically Quentin Beck, you know, like, in his normal self with the mop top and everything. Maybe the, maybe the police threw away his uh, makeup and everything. He decided, like, He's, okay, maybe you'll just forget. I, hiding down and hiding in plain sight. I mean... If he would have dressed like Lugud Reinhardt again, Peter would have caught it in a minute because, like, that over-exaggerated, like, German psycho look. Right. <laughs> he has, like, a hearing aid in his, in his ear, right? Or is that a radio or something? I love uh. the force. I love the unintentional foreshadowing. That woman's like, I'm going to write to the mayor about arresting Spider-Man because who's mayor right now in the current books? J. Jonah Jameson. I think uh-huh. that is a, I think that is a, uh, um, a radio. Do you think that's, like, a translation thing? What, what do you think that is? Hooked up to his ear. The thing How that be a thing in the on the bottom of page seven, he has some sort of speaker plugged into his ear. I know it's not an iPod because those came out like the next year. He's listening <laughs> to Amazing Spider-Man classics. Of course he is. Amazing <laughs> Spider. Nothing on earth can stop me now. Because we are in 1966. <laughs> oh, I think I it's see. a tape recorder or something, so like yeah. he can record with patience. Because what's he's? It's like he's holding a tape recorder or a pipe or something in the next panel. Who knows what it is? It's a microphone. Yeah, is it? Conversation. Yeah. What, if I was John, I'd be like, why are you recording this conversation with me? <laughs> well, actually, I, I can sort of explain that. <laughs> because uh, in going back to the miniseries of Marvels, like, James is like, my life is on record. I have nothing to hide. So he can probably like, feel – he can probably put on airs and feel comfortable saying anything to somebody if it's recorded. Uh, Jonah is oblivious to his cockness. I mean, it's just he has no idea how obstinate and rude and unseemly an individual he is. He thinks that anybody can look at him and, you know – See a perfectly normal human being. So Quentin Beck says, I've been planning my revenge for years. Has it been that okay. long? <laughs> I think and this is this is good. This goes back to my thinking about Peter's age. I think and I, and I know it's not a great theory, but I think right now Peter's eighteen and Quentin Beck first showed up actually, yeah, because like Quentin Beck didn't show up that long ago, even even in comics time. It would have been like a year at most. You could it's retcon dead. that he could be talking about issue two, which hasn't been retconned yet. That like he was one of those space aliens. Then I'd say it's been years. This is issue twenty four. Thirteen came out eleven months previous. So yeah, it, it works with Jameson when he says I've hated him for years. That works fine, but well, yeah, Flash that... Thompson, like the, the next issue, which takes place like the next day, when Flash Thompson's like, oh, let me tell you about that fight weeks ago. Oh god! Yeah, the, the, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't take place. It takes place later that night because Peter leaves Liz's house. I, when I was reading that, I actually noted that down a couple of times. That the the years thing. I'm thinking, you know, how this these issues are supposed to take place in some kind of pseudo real time. I'm thinking they might have even been happening a little faster than real time because it seems to come across that way. The amount of times that they keep making references to things that happened in years, or it was you said Jameson. Um, and uh, Beck also do it, where they're kind of like, ah, I've been, you know, he's been a thorn on my side for years. I just, I just assume that we're supposed to think that more time has passed than just the normal. What time. I think happened is that Stan Lee was writing the writing the issues as though they're in real time, but he got mixed up because Quentin Beck has not been around since as long as Spider Man has been around. So, the, in their in his in the minds of both the writer and the characters, you know. 
like 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 Spider Man showed up in 1962 to 1965, but even even though that doesn't really work out, but um, he just got kind of mixed up with where Mysterio was regarded because Mysterio's not been on the scene for that long. When he says he's been playing his revenge for years, I mean, you can retcon and saying he's talking about since issue two with the space aliens. But 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 even then, that's like only two years. It's not really for years. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. It's not a long time, pal. Well, it's kind of like, wasn't there a a reference in a Juggernaut story recently about the first Juggernaut story happening months ago? Oh, don't get me started. Uh, Uh, We're not going to use that as an example at all. (laughs) <laughs> or, or Amazing Spider-Man issue 546, where they said a few years ago Gwen Stacy died. <laughs> well, everything in Spider-Man history happened a few years ago. Well, they've actually given a timeline for when Gwen Stacy died, and as of the late 90s, it was seven years ago. That and I would guess few. that... Say what? That can be a few. Can be seven several. years is not a few years ago, and that was in the late 90s. I'm sure that like another year or two has been added on there since. So okay. if anything, Gwen's been dead for close to a decade. Not a few years ago. I mean, if you go with the idea that Peter Parker is not 27, but closer to 30 in the comics right now. It, yeah, because I, I think Gwen died when Peter was about 20, 21 years old. But uh, this, is, this is really tangential. <laughs> <laughs> well, he start, it started in his senior year of high school. And uh, has he been you know, out of high school? for? I don't right? think he started in his senior year. Where did no, he no, I, th- I think he started when he was a said- sophomore. He said, like, sophomore and junior in different places. But, I mean, it, it, you're getting senior from because... Like, he says, you know, he might get a scholarship, but, I mean, you can be eligible for scholarships, you know, years before. I mean, when in, the, in the 60s, I think when you're in high school, you really concentrate on graduating more than the actual grade you're in. I mean, I wouldn't know since I was – I was that was decades before I was born, but – Well, actually, I'm, in the unmasking, he says, I've been Spider-Man since I was 15. So. Yeah, yeah it, and, and, I, and I go along with that. I, I believe that. Especially yeah, since there were six months gap between the publication of Amazing Fantasy 15 and Amazing Spider-Man number one. Who knows what all he did during that time? Well, we, we know some of it because we have the other AF issues, but... It's flip-flop between 15 and 16, but lately there's been more of a trend of 15, especially since Civil War. And Ultimate Spider-Man, he was 15. Yeah, that he's, a sophomore. he's a sophomore forever in that book. But anyways, this is really far off you know, the track. This so, is really confusing. <laughs> backing the truck up a little bit. <laughs> on page 8, and I know that we got way past that, but I had a couple things I wanted to say. Uh, like we ever go in order? Yeah, like we ever go in order. <laughs> on page 8, Aunt May actually says something that actually turns out to be true. Peter's reading the newspaper about Ludwig Weinhardt and uh, how Spider-Man's a mental case and says it's sure to real crack up real soon. And she says, don't read such things, dear. They'll give you nightmares. And, like, she's right for once. Cause he I thought she was wrong. I read that. I was like, no, they won't. So... But they do. He he starts freaking out and dreaming stuff. And by the way, Peter, I just ordered a ten thousand dollar hat for Anna Watson's next <laughs> team party. I used that. You know that rent for a year you got us a few months ago. Yeah, um, we have a new hats. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that dried up in three days. <laughs> I need. There was actually like a long running plot thread about a hat that Spider Man gave to Aunt May, like or, or in the eighties, like. That had like there was a tracking yeah. device from the Kingpin and like Smythe's son was using it and really it was, like, it, yeah, yeah. It was uh, in a uh, ASM Annual 19 I think was where it really came to a head oh, yeah wow. yeah it, it it was this like it was in either web or spect- it was in web mostly but yeah like it went it, it went into the main amazing books and <laughs> they basically somehow the shenanigans with that hat led Smythe to believe that Mary Jane Watson was secretly Spider Man. Oh, I read that actually. Yeah, that that was that was weird. So he makes a comment about you know what if I'm cracking up and I don't know it. I just finished a Spanish course, which I got an A. Hooray! Hooray. But uh, it was built. Uh, the textbook for the course was this anthology of short stories, and one of the short stories was called "Letter to a Psychiatrist." Not really because it's in Spanish, but um, the guy writes a letter to the psychiatrist, and his whole thesis is that you know he's really freaked out about crazy people because they don't know that they're crazy and he's had crazy people in his family so he's always wondering if he's going to go crazy and he says that the first sign that I'm crazy I want to kill myself because I don't want to go crazy and then not know that I am and uh, he actually does end up putting bullets in his own head and his brain spilling onto the desk but um, happy ending yeah it, it, very few of the stories this semester had happy endings but um, but yeah it's just kind of like Mexico <laughs> Was this on the final? It was on. We we were tested over it. It wasn't part of the final. It was earlier in the semester. But um, what the heck? <laughs> we we had some really interesting stories. I would say you should read some, except that they're all in Spanish, and you don't speak Spanish. So for now, 
for now. No habla espanol. No habla. Going, going towards the, uh, like, you know, rubber banding around towards the end. I, I really love the quote, Jameson and Flash, where um, Mysterio says, if you hadn't walked in, I would have defeated Spider-Man by unmasking him. And Jameson, like, flips the F out. He's like, you mean, if I hadn't burst in just then, if I hadn't interrupted what I did, Spider-Man would have been beaten? I've hated him for years! I've played a million games to destroy him, to defeat him, to destroy him! And now, when you were just about to do it, I ruined everything! And, it's, and Flash is like, what a gig, what a gas, what do I tell the gang? Boy! <laughs> my, I, my idol talked to me, he spoke to me. Even if he called me a fool, he spoke to me. What a day. I, I really like those quotes because they're just... Oh no, and no then the follow-up, up, like, nothing can ruin this now. Not even Parker can ruin this now. And the very next panel, it's Liz Ellen, like, ooh, there's Peter Parker. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, nothing can ruin this day. Next panel, his girlfriend making a play for Peter Parker. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, love, love the Steve Ditko expressions on Jameson. First the shock and horror, and then the big face palm. It's just like, oh my gosh, that is so hilarious. Yes, Jameson yeah. is I love how Flash is like when he's confronting Jonah. He's like, um, I believe that this is their first um, meeting. Between Flash I mean, and Jonah? Know. Yeah. Yeah, it is because he he identifies himself. Well, as, like, they meet, uh, issue, well, they didn't meet, but they were in the same place in issue fifteen. I don't, they yeah, didn't, in, issue, I don't... in issue fifteen and seventeen, they were in the same place, and I'm sure that there's been some like chapter ones and untold tales that have had them meet earlier. But in terms of like publishing in order, this is like their first. But yeah, when he's like, "Oh, I'm, I'm president of the Spider-Man fan club," and I'm like, "Really? That's still like, aren't you the only member of that club?" I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> "Well, you know, it's Flash. He'll, he'll, he'll say that to his dying day." Did, did it start did it, growing did, again after he came back? Yeah, did like. Did, that that's going not, on. Not that I think about it. I mean, it's it's kind of like in his biography that you know not only was Flash you know Peter's uh, jock rival, but he was also the president of the Spider-Man fan club. I mean, they actually do kind of like leave that as a part of his history, even though it's useless. <laughs> even though like it was there was one meeting of the fan club and it, like crashed and burned, and it like made the Allen family go so broke that they had to like change their last name like nine times in disgrace from Hilton <laughs> the brand to Allen. Yeah. Yeah. That whole that whole Jonah Flash thing. I love that line where Jonah. I'm, I'm looking for the thing now where where Flash is basically like, why don't you write about somebody else? And Jonah's like, why don't you go jump into traffic or something like that? I want uh, a bastard. Oh yeah, here it is. Flash says, why don't you pick on the Human Torch for a while or those nutty X Men? And and Jameson, not even looking at him, just walking away, goes, why don't you go play in traffic? I love that so much. I mean, how much of a jerk is Jonah telling a kid to go play in traffic? If Rupert Murdoch told a teenager to go play in traffic, can you imagine <laughs> the type of backlash that would be like if the real world equivalent of J. Jonah Jameson did that? Wow. That yeah, would like exactly. that would make headlines. Well, I mean, because, you know, a lot of news today is not really news, to be honest. I mean, so what do you think about the people? actual plot here with Mysterio and his robotic cat and bat? And everything else, projecting images of spider villains on the walls to make Spider-Man think he's crazy, and then the, the room the, that rotates somehow without making any noise. The robots were bollocks, but uh, I think the plot is <laughs> actually pretty good. I mean, I, I, I like the idea. It's another one of those. If you're in the '60s reading this, it's like the hero thinks he's going crazy. The teenage hero. It's one of those like really innovative things that Stanley does, which I think makes him a good writer, and this is a good issue. They had the miniseries recently, Spider-Man Fever, which had some really tripped up art and i think the artist was going for like a 60s psychedelic you know ditko-ish feel is what he says but i think this is the few times where ditko actually taps into that psychedelic side of his art you know with all the the blazing lights well, everywhere a lot, of, a lot of hippies really love steve ditko just because he's really psychedelic and they they always, they always maintain that he was probably taking drugs even though he is certainly not a guy kind of guy to do with that just because his ideology but yeah this is this is the kind of like really interesting stuff that he does. Like he, he even gives like dimensions in, in, in Peter's uh, hallucinations. Like you see like like um background dimensions, like like you know, like a like a cube and everything. Really he even has of... goldfish. Yeah. yeah, one really <laughs> one really cool touch is when uh, Spider Man first walks into the upside down room and then Reinhardt's dialogue or Mysterio's dialogue is actually in upside down word balloons. Which is awesome. <laughs> that is so cool. It's like I, I, the early comics didn't really from what I can remember, didn't really have a lot of that weird stuff like that, but this, this that was good. I actually find that tactic, you know, with the upside down worst, be kind of annoying. But since it was yeah. so not done at this point, you know, I, I definitely give him props and think it's cool for, you know, tapping into that here. When yeah. I was a kid, um, I'd, 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 I would make my own comics. And I did a scene where Spider-Man was upside down on a wall or a, or a ceiling, 
And because I drew him upside down, I I did the dialogue upside down. So when I made it right side up, I was like, oh man, this, the dialogue's upside down. I gotta write it again. But now, yeah, how I, is I, think, he, I think in this situation, it's pretty cool. How is he staying on the ceiling at the top of page 14? Is he like. It could be an it's, illusion. It's Mysterio. That's true. Well, no, he says he has a room that actually physically turns around, right? So it actually is that way. I'm more, I'm more, more thinking about like how the the curtains are perfectly straight and stuff. Like that. <laughs> They're actually made out of sticko. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Maybe, maybe that's not even him. Maybe it's like a robot that's upside down in the chair. That's like so, I don't that, know. Would far, that would be a far way to for for the scene. Yeah, how does this work? Well, see, that's the problem, and this is all part of the problem with Quentin Beck. Is and I read this in the letters called of a recent issue of the Amazing Spider-Man. Um, following the Mysterio story from a few months back, and somebody points out, and I kind of agree, the problem with the character, at least this particular incarnation of the character, is that he always shows his hand. He tells his secrets, and while on the one hand it's cool for the reader to see how the magician does his magic, on the other hand, we can now see through him. And we always know, every time he shows up, there's just a cheap stunt going on. And I I, I don't say I dislike Mysterio, because I kind of like the concept to a degree, I'd also like to be a bit more mystified on how he's doing what he's doing. I, I was um, re-listening to the episode with Mike Bailey on there and how he didn't like Mysterio because his kind of plot is just a certain type that he doesn't really care for. But this is really like a an innovative, inspired idea for a supervillain. He, I mean, he's not in costume the entire... The entire issue of Mysterio is not in a special costume. He's in disguise as this guy, but when he's unmasked, you just see his face. You, unless If you never... If you never I don't know, read the Sinister Six issue or Mysterio's other appearance, but you, like, heard of him, you would just think he's a guy. You would, you would think he's, like, a normal guy just, like, you know, doing this stuff, even though he has a wacky costume. So this, this is kind of, like, really nuanced. But that's the problem with Mysterio, though, because you can only... I mean, how many times can a character fall for the same thing over and over and over again? Mysterio's kind of a, kind of has that one trick, and it works if you use it, like, moderately, but pretty much every Mysterio story has him using some variation of the same trick over and over again, which is a little strange. That Spider-Man and it mostly falls. ends the same way, where Spider-Man's like, wait a second, if I close my eyes, I'll figure out which is the real one. Yeah, and pretty much. Like, I, I was just about to bring up that one unlimited issue where, of course, I, it should have been Mysterio, because my Spider-Sense didn't go off. When there's illusions and he doesn't know like what's real, he could use his spider sense to like kind of guide him in the direction. Yeah. His spider sense, the you know, Swiss Army knife of powers, you know. Right. Hey, I like I like that about it. Leave a little mystery. When Flash says go pick on those naughty X Men, that bothers me. I like I, I get the joke, but yeah, it's like. <laughs> I mean, that's like the the in-universe equivalent of saying, go pick on the Mexicans, you know, because like, <laughs> they're like a minority that are like, you know, persecuted against. Well, not no, only I, that, but wasn't X-Men like not selling very well? That, I mean, that, that, that's I was gonna like say, a joke. I was going to say that that's sort of where I thought they were going with it. It's more like that. He just mentioned them because it's like, hey, kids, go buy, you know, go read it, the latest issue of X-Men. Please read it. <laughs> well, I, I definitely yeah. think that, you know, Stanley is not above a cheap plug to his other books. Um I don't oh, think there no, was the annual sir, approved Spider-Man Annual One. Anyone? I don't think there were any <laughs> significant problems with the sales on the X-Men at this point. Because remember, this is still Lee and Kirby's work, and Lee and Kirby did some great stuff on that book. I think we're up to like issue eight or nine at this mm-hmm. point, and uh, it was it was still really good stuff. I'm actually. Well, was it was it stuff that appealed to people at the time, or is it like I if have, you go back I, on it? Because like I, I mean, like as we say at the time here, Fantastic Four and Spider-Man were selling like hotcakes, but. Was X Men at the time selling well until Kirby left, or was it just not? From what I understand, it never sold well until like, like Claremont got on. From what I understand, well, once Claremont got on, it really started taking off and becoming like Marvel's top book. But you know, in the '60s, I mean, even Strange Tales with the Johnny Storm wasn't selling very well, and that's I think why they replaced his strip with you know Spies. X Men Eleven was on the stage by uh, on the stands by this point. Help help me out here, John, because uh, the early X Men issues are kind of a blur for me. What issue did Kirby stop doing full pencils and just started doing layouts? Was that I, I want to say it was before Eleven though, right? No, it was fifteen ish. I can tell. Okay. Uh, wait, you mean full pencils versus layouts? That's actually that part. I don't know. Uh, uh, at one point, he stopped doing full. He was just doing layouts, and uh, Werner Roth was actually doing the penciling. Over yeah, Kirby, do the breakdowns and then Roth will do the finishes. I'm going to tell you because I'm on the Marvel Creators database right now. 
X Men was also yeah. one of the first of the Marvel titles because you know Stanley was writing everything. That was one of the first ones that Stanley left. Like I think if you get Essential Classic X Men number one, like by the end of volume one, it's already being written by Roy Thomas or someone. Kirby left an issue or two before Stan did. But I'm just looking to see who's the uh... <laughs> an issue before Stan did. They, yeah, they really care about that book. Yeah, you I, are I so don't... right. I didn't realize. Okay, Jack Kirby did pencils and layouts up through issue eight. And then Alexander oh. Toth helped him out, and then Werner Roth helped him out for one, two, three, four. Is that is that like like Space Ghost Alex? Because it's pronounced Alex Toth. It could be. Yeah. Um, up through yeah. seventeen, Jack Kirby was helping. Uh, uh, Werner Ro- Werner Roth was helping. Is it Roth? Werner Roth was helping uh, Jack Kirby through seventeen, oh. and then Stan Lee's last writing was issue twenty one, and then Roy Thomas took over. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. But the I'm trying to remember if, because I, I don't remember the credit boxes for it, if they even, I, I'm just trying to remember how much of a Forrest Kirby was on the book at that point. But, eh, whatever. The point still stands. He was still on the book, so they could still probably sell it as a Lee Kirby book at that point. Yeah. And, sure, mentioning it would definitely help drum up sales. And maybe that's one of the reasons that Kirby left is because it wasn't doing well. Maybe. Ran- random tidbit of the day, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> random. That, that was our that was our one. Of the day, that, that random tidbit number six. Of, of no, no, but time. even another random tip that Werner Roth wasn't actually using his real name; he was using an alias while he was doing that book. I'm trying to remember what the alias was. I think it was like Ga- Jay Gavin was his alias. Oh yeah, there is a bunch of Jay Gavin in that time. Okay, so that's Werner Roth in disguise. Yeah, Jay Gavin is an alias for <laughs> Werner Roth. <laughs> disguise. <laughs> Is it because they could? They it's like Werner. a Ludwig Reinhardt disguise. <laughs> is it because Werner was a German name? I I have no idea. I bet I bet yes. somebody could look that up and probably find it really easily. But I, I I really don't remember why. Then again, I mean Stanley and Jack Kirby are also aliases. So what does that tell you? Is Jack Kirby a pseudonym too? Yeah, Jack Kirby's real name is Jacob Kurtzberg. Oh right, right, right. Yeah. I knew Stan Lee was Stanley Lieber. And that yeah. he was his brother. On the last page, Peter Parker's talking to Aunt May, and she's all freaked out. Peter, I was wondering where you were. If you were all right, I was so worried about you. And he's like, you know, I'm sorry I rushed out that way before. Honest, I promise I won't do it again. Don't you worry about a thing. I'm just fine, okay? And to quote Michael Bailey, Gotta sing, gotta dance. <laughs> gotta, gotta keep Aunt May, you know, looking happy here. Yeah. It's the life that Peter lives. I, I actually, it's kind of human what Peter's doing as, like, on this last page as compared to uh, like what Batman and Superman would be doing in the Silver Age. He's oh basically, you know, like doing this as revenge and he says, you know, yeah, I'm going to do this despite Betty. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. this is the protagonist of the book. That's like a very like human thing that he's doing. You know, I it's not like a sympathetic... Boys would kind of like relate to him to like, yeah, yeah, date that girl. It's like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, like he's basically doing this like, oh, I'll show Betty, you know, she wants to write to Ned Leeds, who cares? Right. You know, I'm uh, I'm just going to go study with Liz. He he says I'll show her like that's the exact like thought balloon. <laughs> <laughs> because she has it coming. I've always wondered about Liz like when I was younger and I was reading this and Untold Tales where basically it never looked like she wanted to be Flash Thompson's girlfriend, but like she'd break up with him but then like the next issue they'd be back together no explanation, but she'd still be like, you know, insulting him and trying to get with Peter. And in this issue they say there's like a caption that says, cut to Liz girl- Allen, reluctant girlfriend. reluctant girlfriend. And it's like, wait, it's it's like she's being held as, as his girlfriend against his will or something. Well, it's, I mean, I, I... <laughs> like be my girlfriend or else like she's his reluctant <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> the out of box explanation is easy because it's drama. But yeah, trying to find an in the box explanation is, is I don't well, Liz know. Is, Liz is cuckoo. And, you know, she mean. Like, yeah, he was. Me, you know, you know what it's doing? She's stringing him along until she can get with Peter. Like, they'll go out, but I bet you she doesn't kiss him. <laughs> then again, there wasn't a whole lot of kissing in this book to begin with anyway. So. Then again, they a... could just have a backseat relationship until they uh, until she gets up with somebody else. A backseat Liz relationship. <laughs> Liz, is, Liz is just a horrible human being. I mean, we, we've established that. I mean, because she, <laughs> she insults Flash to his face during the day and calls him stupid and, like, openly, like, tries to get with his rival in front of all of his friends. But then, like, behind closed doors, yeah, she'll date him. Well, she's a teenage girl. The majority of teenage girls are horrible human beings. She's a skank by a day, and she'll blow you at night. Well, I mean, she's all <laughs> she's always been portrayed as kind of like you know I don't want to say cheap, but you know kind of shallow. You know, she's always kind of been shallow. Do you think she's always been like that, or that's been like flashes of her personality? 
I mean, do you think um, that like that's that's that's, that's we, like the main? We've seen deeper of things of her, but okay, like you know, in during Civil War, when both Betty and Liz found out that Peter was Spider Man, they both had very different reactions. Look at Liz's reaction. Um, well, to be when, fair, uh, who do you, who do you think has the worst life? When Mary Jane died. Mary Jane. <laughs> there you go. When right. when Mary Jane died, and people were like there for Peter. Instead of supporting Peter when Mary Jane died, what did Liz say? She said, get away from me. You're cursed. Every woman that you touch dies. You can't be around me anymore. I'm not joking. That, that's not like paraphrasing. You know, like, <laughs> this happened. This was in a story. But Liz she's young like, and impressionable at this point. Yeah. Well, okay. Do you think that's – I don't know. I, uh, that's, that's, not the, that's a very interesting thing to analyze, and I'll attempt and fail to analyze it further. I mean, I'm not saying that she doesn't have her deep moments, but she's, you know, kind of a shallow person at times, you know, like very, very... I may be confusing it with the Spectacular Spider-Man cartoon version, where she's a bit of... She's a little bit of yeah. <laughs> she has a bit more going for her in that cartoon. But yeah, reluctant <laughs> girlfriend, like, that just has, like, some, like, complications. Like, she's this, like, abused person who, like, you know, is afraid to leave or something. Well, she's like a think... boss to be, like, an abusive uh, boyfriend. It's too nice. No, I mean, I, I think you basically see that Liz wears the pants in that relationship a few different times. Mm-hmm. On page 16, right in that middle, that the center square of the of the of the page, is that there's a dog walking next to Flash without a leash? Is that, well, is that a leash what? No one's holding it. It has a leash and no one's holding it. It's just running yeah. along. I, I couldn't tell if that dog was with Flash, if somebody had let go of the... Because there's no one chasing after it or anything like that in the panel. I just... I don't know. That, that panel confused me. I was looking at that for, like, three minutes. I'm like, what? Because it was so conspicuously framed, I thought the dog was important to the story for some reason. And I'm like, uh, wait, wait. <laughs> It's one of Mysterio's robot animals. <laughs> yeah, scroll, maybe. Scroll. It is out- you know, it is outside of Ludwig Reinhardt's house. Maybe it was like a, like a gar- like a robot. It's, it's Amadeus like, Cho's scroll dog. <laughs> no, I, I just think it's just I, it's kind of a neat little detail that you know, random dogs running by have gotten away from their owners, and they try to be friends with you, and then they keep on going. And, and, and that's in that sort of sense, it's kind of a neat little detail. Page nine, the bottom panel. That's a really cool panel where Spider-Man swinging and says, "Glad I didn't forget to grab my spider beam again." You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I it's it's cool that he went back and got his spider beam. It, it's very it's very important to not lose that expensive. Wait, piece wait, of- wait, wait, wait. Okay, page nine, the panel uh, where you see Spider Man. Yeah, where he, he doesn't say that in my version. What? What? what, says, what? Are you he serious? Says, there's well, a light in there's a light on Jameson's office. He'll know where I can, can find Doctor Reinhardt. I've got to see him, and that's all he says. There's not a second balloon to the right. No, there's not. <laughs> they retconned you, dude. There's a well, second balloon that says "Glad I didn't forget to grab my spider beam again." Are you reading oh. an essential or? Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, they, they, they probably kind of been joking about it. I mean, there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, it goes reason. back to the whole, you know, question of should they edit mistakes? Because it's cool that they fix the mistake, but at the same time, you're not reading the theatrical release of the comic. You know. What do yeah, you mean that's... mistake, John? Whatever do you mean mistake? I, I, I wouldn't. Stanley never makes mistakes. There's no mistake. He went back and he grabbed his spider beam. They establish it here. <laughs> not, not here. Not down here in Nashville. Well, I mean, it, it, <laughs> they, they, they didn't feel it. Though, <laughs> and so he didn't have a spider beam. <laughs> <laughs> that that last page, not not the last page of the issue, but the one across from that. What the hell are those things in that ad? Grow two living monsters in your own room? <laughs> that scared the hell out of me when I saw that. <laughs> it's like a Ripley's Believe It or Not, there are these two grotesque monster things. If Jonah would probably, like, read these ads and, like, order them, thinking, they'll stop Spider-Man. And then, like, they'd, like, turn on the city. <laughs> <laughs> then again, earlier in the issue, there were just, like, there was one page of ads of, like, these jerk hole, like, uh, contraptions. <laughs> there are websites all about the, uh, um, Pyramid schemes and ripoffs that kids' comic ads had. Oh, sell so grit. Yeah. Wonderful. What was it? Spider Peter Parker was in a uh, an interview in the Amazing Spider Man just recently, and they're like, "What kind of experience do you have?" No, it wasn't amazing. It was it was Web. It was was it Ben Riley? Oh, frack! I can't remember the context. But he said that whenever he was younger, he used to sell a lot of grit. It was this newspaper that just advertised comic books all the time. Do y'all remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. No. Vaguely. Just like June or May or June that they, they did that. I, was, I thought that was a really, really neat nod. Whoever wrote that, 
gets points. So Spider's Web, the letters call him, becomes the Spider's Web this month, which is, you know, Ooh. trumpet. Fans. And it will never be the same again. A little pretentious there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes it easier to say because now I can say the Spider's Web instead of just, and now we go to Spider's Web. And Kitty Holmes, not Katie Holmes, at least I don't think it's Katie, uh, she's from Ohio University. She thinks that Peter is too cool for high school, and they need to move him into college. And the answer person admits that they're toying with the idea. So we've been getting hints for several issues now that college is on the horizon. Toying with the idea, like, like you know, we might send him to college, but we might not. We might keep him in high school forever. Well, at this point, we're only, what was this? This is 24, right? He's graduating in four months. Yeah, yeah. Right. Dicko would later say that he thought it was a mistake. Uh, 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 not only Dicko, but some other creators, like, they've all said that they thought it was a mistake to take Peter out of high school. Yeah. That's, it's, that's, uh, I hate that. I mean, because, okay, what, like, what all that is much better in when he's in high school than when he's out of high school? Because, yes, you have the master planner and the origin and introduction of the villains, but there was so much better stuff, I, I, I think, in to college issues and beyond than there are in the first 28 issues. I mean, I don't, th- I don't think that argument holds up very well at all. On the other well, hand, you had a whole lot of pressure from readers who were writing in letters saying, don't let Spider-Man stay in high school forever. Peter's life has to advance. That's what makes Marvel different from DC is that characters have lives that progress. And so, you know, that's why Fantastic Four, they had a marriage and a baby and Avengers to an, had, an, an amnesia engagement. And Avengers had costume changes. Yeah, I'll say that I think getting him out of high school at some point was a good idea, but 28 issues was kind of fast, I think. Uh, um, I, I, I'm i glad that they took him out of high school, because one of the things that, I, that I've liked about Spider-Man is, like, you can, like, track the advancements of, oh, this is the issue where he graduates high school, oh, this is where this hap- this is where he gets his first apartment, this is where he graduates college, this is where he drops out of graduate school, like, you know, I like that there's milestones, I know, but I mean, this 28 issues is, is like lightning speed for a character. To, I mean, Ultimate Spider-Man has been, what, almost 150 issues? That's too long. The X-Men, like, finished high school, like, in their eighth issue or something. Yeah, they did. I think it was the end of issue seven. On the other hand, for it was three years of publication time, from Amazing Fantasy 15 to Amazing Spider-Man 28. And so that seems to me like a reasonable amount of time for someone who gets bitten by a spider as a sophomore three years later to graduate high school. To me, that seems like a logical thing to do. They weren't looking at this as a 40-year franchise. They definitely weren't. I mean, we can definitely pick it apart in hindsight and give them advice, but um, I can can see why they did it at the time. Yeah, I'm saying it it seems logical from a real-time perspective, which which I guess is what they were doing at that point, because I guess they didn't think comics were going to last forever, but... From from the modern perspective of the character has been around for forty years, twenty eight issues is fast. So yeah, it's, it's more of a hindsight argument than anything else. And I'd say in ninety percent of the adaptations, like they always put him in high school, and like that's like almost one of their golden eras. But and it's funny, like when you look back, he you know he wasn't in there for that long. But that's no. like you know what the movies like to go back to. Well, uh, I mean, like like it's it, one thing he got his powers in high school, but. I mean, the cartoons that were out at the time were when Dicko was on the book, where, and the majority of Dicko's run, he is in high school. I thought that was just by happenstance. I mean, the 80s cartoon, he was in college. Spider-Man's Amazing Friends, he was in college. Uh, 90s show, he was in college. Um, well, maybe, 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 my, maybe my little percentage is off then. That was just a guesstimate. Yeah, the movies even had him mostly in college. I mean, he was out of high school by the halfway point of the first movie and into ESU. Which is not. I really, right. I really think the majority idea of Spider-Man isn't like, like legitimately, like not in high school. I mean, a young adult, but not you know a guy who's a senior in high school. I think it's like around that like MTV age kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I think but, that's a, I think that's a good. I mean, someone who's like at the end of adolescence, verging on adulthood, is a great age for Spider-Man. I think the notion they're doing with Ultimate, keeping him in high school, definitely has merit. Um, unlike Josh, who's dropping the books. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah I saw that. I saw that on Facebook. Oh. What's awesome is that it's not the 150th issue because it's the 16th issue of the new run, and they had 133 before, and that's 149. Because Maybe they're I, counting that that like one shot or something. There was a requiem that was two issues. Yeah, and so I, it, unless they're they're gonna count something obscure like that wizard number one half giveaway issue or something. Hey, that's, that's the only logic I could come up with. 
I don't know. Nowadays, like, you know, they'll relaunch a book if, like, somebody changes a costume. I right. mean, why did they relaunch New Avengers? Because Norman Osborn was defeated? Hey, how about they, like, have a fight with Kang and then relaunch the next issue? Well, they and, relaunched like, just... all of the they relaunched, relaunched all of the Avengers books because the tale they were telling with that everything that started after Disassembled is over now. But it's not a tale. It's a title. Like, when the tale of Spider-Man in high school ends, like, if Spider-Man was being published now, as soon as he would graduate high school and go to college, they would have relaunched the book. It's not a tale. It's a title. These aren't seasons of a TV show. Like, I get it. Okay, it's... But it, it's, it's becoming much more commonplace to relaunch a book every, you know, every time an era ends, like with Avengers Reborn and then Avengers Disassembled and... But and then Spider Man was just relaunched. Ultimate Spider Man was relaunched because of the entire Ultimate Universe coming, you know, to a head. It, there was a flood. It didn't come to it. There was there was a flood. Everybody died, a, Josh. No, yeah, some people. Okay, and and how many times does that happen in the regular Marvel? You for like <laughs> it, half, it can go half some, of the half of the heroes of your entire universe getting killed off in one storyline. I don't know how many times has that happened in the regular. Okay, so did Amazing Spider-Man relaunch during Heroes Reborn and Heroes Return when all those heroes, like when half of the heroes in the Marvel Universe were seemingly killed? Did they did they end the book for Spider-Man then? They did end the book for Spider-Man then, but Spider-Man that's not Ultimate Spider-Man. Okay, but Ultimate Spider-Man, like why they he didn't die? <laughs> the, the the book's getting relaunched because some people in New York, like, are you serious? It's a marketing like, thing. They have old no, data. and it's they, a dumb marketing thing. <laughs> okay, well, you can have that opinion. So, Amazing Spider-Man Classics, ladies and gentlemen. So here, here's, a, here, here's a funny story. In the mid-70s, in the mid-70s, Teen Titans ended the book. A few years oh, no. later, they, they decided to restart the book again. Guess what they did? They, kept... they continued with the old numbering. It's well, a it's funny like, thing. It's like Flash Comics ended with 103. And whenever they brought it back as The Flash, they started with 104. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. James Morton complains about calling Spider-Man Spidey. And I remember when I was going through all of my Crawl Space episodes, like they're mine, all of the Crawl Space episodes, I heard someone on an interview, one of the interviewees, uh, when Brad asked how he got into Spidey or something like that, the person said, well, Spidey is a character from a kid's reading comic called Spidey Super Stories. Spider-Man, on the other hand, and I thought personally that was kind of pretentious, but I was wondering if y'all had any opinions on the Yeah, that's, that's the word I was just about to say, pretentious. Like, who... It's like- it, it's not kind of pretentious. It's very pretentious. <laughs> Stanley, the, crea- the, the creator, Morton. calls him Spidey. James Morton, wherever you are, you're an idiot. <laughs> Scott Gardner, please fast forward your MP3 player. A few minutes. <laughs> Finally, I'm waiting for John, this. John Byrne has like said a few times that he thinks that it's disrespectful when people call Batman bats and like Superman soups that you know that you should call them by their titles. And that nicknames are very disrespectful for superheroes. I personally oh, yeah, disagree. Yeah, like the fictional characters, I should, you know, respect them and, you know, be silent <laughs> when they're walking around like a little child. Yeah, On the other cool. hand, it's also a kind of personable kind of thing. Like, I mean, okay, if I were in the comic book universe, right, I don't think I would ever call Batman Bats unless I were trying to make fun of him as a villain. I would either be his friend and call him Batman or by name. Or I would be a random guy on the street who referred to him as Batman. But Spider-Man, on the other hand, he's like, he's your friend. He's friendly neighborhood. He wants to be on a par with you, you know. You know, you call him Spidey while you're cheering him on. And and everyone calls him Spidey. Yay, well, that's, that's, Spidey that's the thing. I mean, you know, are we not supposed to call them Bruce and Clark? Are we just supposed to call them by title because, what, they're in the mid-30s? I mean, what kind of logic is that? These are fictional characters. There's that, too. When the creator when the creator of the book calls him by his nickname, you don't really have a leg to stand on by saying that you shouldn't. That's true. And I don't remember who it was that said that, and it's probably better off because I don't like bad-mouthing individual people. Except Steve Wacker. Just kidding, Steve. Um, <laughs> I doubt he listens. But No, no. Well, you've wrote to him twice, so yeah, that was a we, 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 Oh, we had, a, we had another back and forth this week about the Beatles reference from a couple episodes back about Tuesday Weld. He said that he doesn't think that they're uh, – because what happened was in the Ringmaster story, which is issue 22, Spider-Man swings into the Ringmaster's apartment. He says, hey, anybody ever call you Ringo for short? And Ringmaster turns around with a, you know, your generic, what? Who's there? And Spider-Man oh, says, yeah. well, it's certainly not Tuesday Weld. And I was like, what does Tuesday Weld have to do with the Beatles? Because he makes a Beatles reference and says Tuesday Weld, and I was trying to think what could be going on there. But Tuesday Weld was in an episode of a show, The Greatest Show on Earth which was a circus program. So it might have been a reference to that. It's just, you know, possible that he was just, or possible that he was just pulling out a random actress's name as 
you know, uh, I'm not I, that beautiful girl coming to visit you at night. Yeah, I, I, I saw that in your Facebook profile. Uh, <laughs> Facebook status, and I, actually, I think that was like my serious. It's like, hey, it's just like it's the 60s. Choose a well is a popular actress, so he just randomly dropped her, and it's like a non. It's not really a connected reference. It sure isn't Megan Fox. Anyone ever call you Justin Bieber for short? Right. Okay. Well, I guess it that could dates, be any that, of those that, that dates this episode, actually, if we're going to survive for years and years. <laughs> Dude, did some, speaking of Dane, did you see, like, Justin Bieber? There was, like, apparently some hacker or someone that hacked into his Twitter account. So Justin Bieber got revenge on him by putting, that like, the hacker's phone number on his Twitter account and saying, Hey, guys, this is my real phone number. Call and text me. So this, like, random guy <laughs> was getting... <laughs> was awesome. getting like yeah, he he uploaded on YouTube like his phone blowing up because all these people were calling him looking for Justin Bieber. That's pretty cool. This probably gets the award for longest time we've ever spent on a letters page. But I did have one more I wanted to bring up, <laughs> which was um, Donald McGregor. He says that he wants the Jonah Scorpion connection to have big ramifications for Jonah later. Jonah shouldn't get off the hook for that very easily. And I was Done. just like, oh, if he only knew. Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not for a long time, but, you know. But done. <laughs> <laughs> done and done. So um, there are three ad pages this month for other comics being published. The first one, two more triumphs for Marvel, has Daredevil fighting the Submariner for I Forget Why in Daredevil number seven. Um, but then we have Fantastic Four 38 entitled Defeated by the Frightful Four which actually began a multi-part story that I think would actually go six issues before not ending on a cliffhanger. And I believe that was the longest tale that Marvel had told yet in a full-length book. You had your non-full-length stories like the Hulk and Doctor Strange that would, that would you know, work in serial fashion all the time. But uh, Spider-Man didn't have continued stories, and Fantastic Four had not done it that far up to this point. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> I remember yeah. that, like... and. Like, that story led directly, like, almost into the Galactus story, which led, like, most of the FF stories for the next, like, two years, like, starting with that one, like, were one after the other, directly into them with almost no breaks. Yeah, there's a break between 43 leading into 44, but then that story involves the Inhumans, and it doesn't stop. And then you get into the Galactus trilogy. Yeah, it's just... Fantastic (laughs) Four, it's, it's hard to squeeze in other appearances because their continuity is so tight. Yeah, I... I know this is a Spider-Man podcast, but can I can I say that Fantastic Four from 35 to 60 is a, pretty much the greatest stretch of comic books in history? Can, can somebody <laughs> can somebody back really? me up on that? No, really, that, I, that's really I, I, good I, stuff. I honestly believe Fantastic Four numbers 35 to 60 are the, is the greatest single stretch of comic books in history ever. Really? I, I, will, I will not argue with somebody. If you tell me otherwise, I will pimp slap you right down to the ground and walk away. I will not hear any other any other opinion. Well, um, I don't know. Young Justice was pretty awesome. I think, all the way. I think that this Aranya book that's coming out is going to be even better. <laughs> wow! I know where you live, Josh. We don't want Gerard to hang up the call. You know that, right? I'm just looking at the books from 35 to 60 because it. We actually talked about uh, 35 and 36 on the show because they had Peter Parker cameos. Uh, one with him on campus, and one where he's I'm stealing a piece of the cake. Thing. And then it goes into the big six-parter where they lose their powers with the Frightful Four. Daredevil teams up with them to help them beat Doctor Doom. They go after the Inhumans. There's Galactus and the Silver Surfer. Um, then ba- then the Thing goes on a rage because he hates the fact that he's a Thing. They introduce the Black Panther. Silver Surfer strikes back. You have Claw. You have like a big subplot with Claw that finally comes out with him fighting them. Yeah, this is, this is really good stuff. I'm going to go with you. I don't know if I would say the top. Because personally, I just really, really like The Simpsons. But um, <laughs> what? Just ki- I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Simpsons comics, you know, they have The Simpsons comics. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just, yeah comic book just died in the, in the latest issue. Randomly pulling that out of my ass. But no, this is good stuff. Yeah, but which by the way, it's out of print now. But if you can find a copy of uh, Fantastic Four Omnibus Volume Two, it's all in there. It has issues 30 to 60. So if you can, if you can fl- flag through some. Uh, really crappy Vince Coletta inked issues then you get to the good stuff. <laughs> well, I remember being I remember being a teenager and I had those in the essentials and I had like volume for volumes 2 and 3 with the FF essentials. I I I read them like straight through. It wasn't like some of these other essentials where it'll take me a few weeks to read. Like I would spend an afternoon just like ripping through and I'd be like, "Okay, after this next issue I have to do my chores." 
but you know, like to, all of a sudden it's 15 issues later and the whole afternoon's gone. And you also had so the uh, the wedding annual, and you had the um, the Golden Age Human Torch coming back in the fourth annual. Ooh, good mm-hmm. stuff. Yep, good ish. St- Stan Lee got kicked out of the wedding. <laughs> That's right, and Kirby, Kirby too. Yeah, but uh, but the Beatles were there. If you read Marvels, like the Beatles were in the wedding. I think I remember that. But so, they're not sitting together. It's really weird. Yeah, like, they're all in different sections. Oh yeah, that was and, Marvels. Like, Karen Page is there with Foggy Nelson, and she's like staring at one of the Beatles. I remember. Poor Foggy. Like Matt Murdock's not around, and Karen Page still can't get his full attention. So Fantastic Four had all these like ongoing plots that. The story would end, but the comic, like, the main plot would end, but the comic would end on a cliffhanger leading into the next story, and so you'd have these, you know, ongoing storylines with no break, as opposed to Spider-Man, where you have basically done-in-ones, or two-parters, or maybe even the occasional three-parter, but you also have all these character subplots that get just drawn out for years and years. It's like a soap opera. Um, I, I'd say that by the, like... Or mid Ramita run around the first Kingpin story arc, they they basically did that format though, like with the FF, where everything was leaning into the other thing, and it stayed that way for years. Yeah, it eventually did become the norm. I'm talking about now, but I, I do like I, I think I do like the done in ones with with character subplots. I prefer that storytelling. Then two more triumphs for Marvel with Tales of Suspense '65, which tells the first modern Red Skull story though it's actually still set in World War II. And I can't remember, because it's been a while since I read this, there were some of the World War II-era stories that they were actually just redrawing and retelling in the Tales of Suspense books. There was the, f- the first couple, at least, that I read from the Tales of Suspense, I was surprised to see were just rip-offs from Captain America comics from 1941 or whatever it was. And I don't know if this one was one of those or not. Um, but it was the first time Red, Col- Red Skull showed up in the 60s comics. And also, in that same book, someone hijacks Tony Stark's armor, so he has to pull the old gold-painted Mark I out of storage as the new Iron Man fights the old Iron Man. Oh, yeah. I've actually seen um, Bruce Timm did a, a recreation of that cover. I've seen that. Oh, did he? Yeah, like, like, because does, does on the cover, does the um, red and yellow one say, you know, I'm faster, but he's more powerful than me, or something like that. Yeah, they made this huge deal in the text about something that you never actually talked about when he had the old armor, about how it was old and clunky and heavy and hard to control, as opposed to the new armor that was light and fast and super spectacular. But it was just kind of funny, because when he had that old armor and transitioned to the new, they didn't really make that big of a deal about there being much of a change. Sergeant Fury 17, the Howlers fight in World War II, this time in the jungle, so yay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. that deal. comic is awesome don't 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 knock it have you read sergeant fury because no i haven't talked to anyone who's read it i i read very few i've read a handful of issues but they're very good they okay. actually they hit a lot of because sergeant fury was all about the diversity of the cast so they hit a lot of interesting sort of character moments in between the actual bombastic war stories that they were having Okay. Did they ever do a crossover, like when they were doing like their many DC Marvel crossovers? Did they ever do a crossover between Nick Fury and uh, Sergeant Rock? I don't know. I want to say yes. I, 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 they should have, because that's a very obvious one. But you know. I want to say yes, but I can't tell you for certain. I don't, uh, I don't think that would be very really cool if they did. And then finally on the third ad page, Journey into Mystery 115 has The Vengeance of the Thunder God, which wraps up the big fight with the Absorbing Man from the previous month. The Absorbing Man really gave Thor a run for his money this first fight. Um, I think uh, he- 115. So, so that was that was been going on for a decade. Journey to Mystery, really. Yeah, it was one. It's it's Marvel's oldest comic that's still around. Um, at this point. At this point. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey guys, this is Leroy. And this is Brad, and we are the Comic Tube Podcast. And what makes us awesome? We defeated Skynet. We did? Oh, yeah, that's right. No, 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 no. Another reason. You met Siler, and he didn't eat your brains? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. No, no, no. Why else? Because we have higher ratings than Smallville. I thought we had higher ratings than Heroes. No, no, no. All right. No, unlike other podcasts, we focus on comic book movies, video games, and TV show discussions. And more when we're not being lazy. We're the all-new, all-different comic tube. 
on you all different dude we're the same we're the same it's okay oh, yeah. we're the same all right so please go over to www.neverendingchampions.com slash comic tube and check us out so finally, we're going to take a look at the Silver Anniversary issue, Amazing Spider-Man 25, released on March 11th, 1965. And the Bertone Beetle himself is going to tell us all about it. And there was much rejoicing. Take it away, Josh. So, yeah, this is back when issues 25 were not a big deal. Apparently they are now, because at this point the book would have already been relaunched six times. But I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Captured by J. Jonah Jameson, the caption reads... Um, but instead of J. Jonah Jameson, it's a robot with Jonah's face that it's like Dr. Octopus times a thousand. It's got all these little <laughs> tentacle coils and it's wrapped all around Peter. It's I mean, a really bad. Italian all around him. Yeah. We, I mean, th- there's a lot of jokes that can be told here, but we're both uh, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Cause you've heard every single episode. <laughs> so I, um, Spider-Man is shooting his web at the creature's face, but it doesn't look like it's doing any good as Jonah smiles on the robot's viewing screen. But so we, cut to, we cut to this flash page, which is uh, we kind of get a little we kind of get like a little Brady Bunch thing where, you know, on top you have the girls, Aunt May, Betty Brand in the middle and Liz Allen, who looks like she wants to kill both Betty Brand and Aunt May <laughs> <laughs> with her laser eye beams. <laughs> Yeah, Peter looking up at them with the half Spider-Man face. Flash Thompson looking in the corner like, oh, oh. and then on the bottom, the robot in the middle. Which, um, can someone help me out here? Did they ever say the word Spider Slayer in the story? Because I don't think they did. I don't think they did either. I thought yeah. they did. I don't know. Yeah, Jonah on the side and Smythe, who's just called Smythe, not Spencer Smythe yet, on right. one side, and then Alice the maid in the middle. Executive producer Sherwood Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> Against the backdrop of Spider-Man running from the robot around the corner, the swinging script is by Stan Lee. The dazzling drawings are by Steve Give Divko. The loquacious lettering is by S. Rosen. Who is this mysterious S. Rosen? I don't know. Let's ask Sam Rosen. We'll never know. Anyone at home who wants to know, loquacious means that they talk too much. Mm-hmm. So the, the 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 overabundant lettering that's way too much by us. Which is ironic when some girls are, are named Laquisha. And, and ah, like, yes. Oh my. Let's not go there. <laughs> Do you think Spidey's had trouble before? Just wait till you read this one. What happens to a superhero on the run when <clears throat> he has no place to go? <laughs> Sturdy Steve Ditko dreamed up the plot of this tantalizing tale, and it's full of unexpected surprises. Oh, that makes sense due to something that we'll talk about later with the club member. I really so want to know this is true. Yeah, it might, it might be or might not. So turn the page and see if you can guess what's coming next. All right, guys. Everybody, put your hands on the page. We're going to turn and see what's coming next. All right, get ready. On the count of three. I can't breathe. One, two, oh, no. three. Oh. oh. Okay. Ooh. Boy. <gasps> Okay, so Peter Parker is leaving Liz Allen's house after the tutoring session that happens last issue. He's hoping that she digs science now, but as Liz's thought balloons reveal, I dig you even more, Petey. After the the studying session they just had, I hope she does. (laughs) So Peter goes to retrieve his spider beam from last issue. What? (laughs) (laughs) There we go. It, it, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. What? But... Not, not, not that we didn't see this coming Whoa. from your, your, your oh-so-subtle hinting a few minutes ago. <laughs> Wait a minute. But he already retrieved it last issue. Does the whole entirety of this issue take place between those panels, even though he tutors Liz? Ah! Lee! Maybe it's he was part of... It's Mephisto. Maybe, maybe it was part of Lugwood Reinhardt's illusions? It could have been. What, what's going on? Ah! Anyway, he goes to retrieve it, even though he already did. And he's shown in Spider-Man number 24. <laughs> yeah. He sees some car thieves, but there's a cop nearby, so he's like, oh, okay, I don't have to lift a finger. I'll let the cop take care of this. So he uses the spider beam. He shines it on the cop, so the cop's like, a burr, what's going on? Then shines it on the car thieves. So the cop sees him. He's like, oh, I've been after you for some time. And I kind of dig that. Sort of like, yo, over here, bad guys. The spider signal! I better be on the move. It's like, she's like Chief O'Hare or somebody. 
<laughs> Peter takes some pics of the nabbing on the roof. He comes home to a worrying Aunt May, and then and then he makes a spare costume, so he won't have to go through what happened a few issues ago where it was wet the whole time. The next day, he goes to the Bugle and sees Jonah chatting up Norman Osborn for a panel. Norman Osborn, who's not named, and actually – uh. Like, this panel has no significance to the rest of the story. He's like, oh, Jonah's with someone, and it's Norman Osborn. He's like, yeah, don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of your ad personally, and I'll see you at the club tonight. Never touched upon again, so it's kind of like in there seemingly for no reason, but we'll talk about that later. I, I, I know, I know it's the 60s, and the, the word the club has a different meaning, but I find it humorous that Jameson's is saying to Norman Osborn, yeah, I'll see you at the club tonight. With the next <laughs> Imagining like Jonah and Norman at a nightclub. <laughs> well, it, it must be someone important, Josh, because JJ is smiling. Oh, must boom, be. Boom. You can find me in the club. <laughs> okay. Jonah's not interested in the pictures from the nabbing yesterday, so Peter tries to play up Spider-Man's incompetence, like, ah, oh, but look, the cop beats Spider-Man to the punch. They make Spider-Man look bad. Here we Maybe go. You want to buy go. those? This interests Jonah, but it angers an eavesdropping Betty Brands. And th- th- this is like such a like random like this would only happen in the '60s. <laughs> like, <laughs> like she's like. You should know why, Peter. You've been selling too many pictures to J. Jonah. You're beginning to sound like him. Oh, I was just, hey, look, what's that? And there's a giant robot in the middle of the office. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, Betty, while we're arguing, ah, oh, giant robot behind you. And like, look, it's Elvis. <laughs> it's like, so, like, they're arguing. He's like, wait, look, what's that behind you? <sighs> I'm not going to fall for that again. <laughs> Well, there's a man named Smythe who's just in the Daily Bugle offices with his robot. He somehow Hello. Got him. Yeah. <laughs> and he tells Jonah that he's an inventor and he has something that'll help him defeat Spider Man. Which this is like the like the ninth time this plot line has happened where like somebody goes to the Daily Bugle, Oh, I'll help you defeat Spider Is it is there like a waiting room? Well now Jonah's like trying to finally figuring it out. He's like, out, out, I'm not getting mixed up with any more nutty mad scientists. Every time I listen to one of you nitwits, I end up being a laughing stock. Science yep. has always been ruining me. Darn science. Darn yep, that's what my note says. It says Jonah is genre savvy at this point and knows another nutty scientist won't work. But Peter <laughs> looks at this robot and he's like it's basically like a 1960s big bulky robot, you know. It's, it's, it's really so, pretty silly looking. Yeah, he he's amused and he's like, Oh yeah, this thing's gonna defeat me. And Jonah's dismissing Smythe, but Peter's like, wait a second, you know, maybe I can get some comeuppance on Jonah if I convince him to use this robot and then I beat it up in front of him, you know? <laughs> he encourages Jonah to let Smythe demonstrate the robots, which, <laughs> that doesn't go over so well. I love, man, how, set out. I love how he's literally fighting Betty off in that panel. Yeah, Betty's like, like, like yeah. really trying to struggle with him. Yeah, he's like, he probably is a phony JJ, but it can't do any harm to watch him demonstrate in fact, there's always a chance he may really have something. What have you got to lose? While Betty's like, <laughs> like cartoon style has like, like shut up, shut up. Career. Peter Parker, you keep out of this. What's gotten into you? After all, it has to take something special to be able to fight Spider-Man. Maybe that nutty looking robot is just what the doctor ordered. Peter, how can you talk that way? Do you want Spider-Man defeated? It's nay, Betty. If the robot should be able to wall up Spider-Man, you'll get all the credits. And if it doesn't, who's to know? Peter! Hmm. <laughs> Besides, you know you're a lot smarter than Spider-Man could ever hope to be. He's only beaten you before by dumb luck. <laughs> Sooner or later, you're bound to win. This is actually really weird, because like, Peter, Peter's starting to have like, a really evil face. He's like, what's yeah. your Spider-Man? Yeah, after all, look how successful you are. You're a born winner, JJ. Ah, perhaps I was too hasty. And, and the this body- is like this is like in the dictionary next to the word cocky. Yeah, and the body language in these panels, like each panel, Betty's like grabbing onto Peter, like to the point where the last panel, she looks like she's about to break his arm, and Jonah's like, you know, standing all proud and stuff. It's really <laughs> hard work. Yeah. So Smythe demonstrates the Slayer. He gives Peter a spider in a glass round case, and, you know, he tells him to hold the spider because the spider slayer is going to detect it. They turn the Slayer on, and Peter's like thinking, oh, wait a second, maybe this was a bad idea. It wraps its coils, like these big, long coils, as you can see on the cover, around Peter. But nobody suspects a thing because he was holding the spiders anyway. They're like, oh, it should have grabbed the spiders and not you. Oh, well, eh, we'll fix the kinks. He silently panics as he realizes that this robot will be a problem for him because even his spider strength cannot break out of these steel cables. And he's like, oh, shit, isn't it all? 
Yeah. <laughs> Smythe gives some exposition about how the robots, you know, about the robots' powers to Jonah, how, like, it's going to find Spider-Man because of his spider aura, and it'll detect it and track it like a radar, and how Jameson will be able to operate it from a control room on, in the council in the office while it goes around town, and his face will appear on the viewing screen. And then Betty walks by Peter while he's all tangled up and pinches him, saying that she hopes that he never gets out. That's nice. Yeah, Joan and Smythe go into the office to further discuss things after Peter is released. And then Betty kind of gives her reasons about why she's mad about all this. Well, Mr. Parker, I hope you're quite satisfied with yourself. You're even worse than Mr. Jameson. At least he thinks he has a reason to hate Spider-Man, but you haven't. Gosh, oh, gosh Betty. Betty. Yeah. I didn't mean any harm. I thought it would be fun. Fun? Fun to help Spider-Man get captured? And after the way he saved your Aunt May from Dr. Octopus? Honestly, I'll live to be a hundred and I'll never understand you, Peter. Now go join your leader, Jolly Jonah Jameson. Goodbye. Clap, 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 clap. Betty is awesome here. As opposed yeah, to annoying. I actually, like, thought about it at the end of this issue. Like, wow, Betty's actually, like... Almost a sympathetic character, this issue. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. Like, no, I mean, and I'll, t- I'll talk about it later and stuff. But, yeah, th- another reference to Betty living to be 100. Because, you know, as, as we know, when Liz Allen calls her Miss Brand, she feels 100 years old. It's foreshadowing. Yeah, uh, let's see. Peter ponders about how he screwed things up for himself. Because now he made his girlfriend mad at him and he sent a killer robot after himself. Whoops. <laughs> Oops. Whoops. <laughs> Well, what I have in my notes here is that Flash has some timeline issues because he's he kind of does. He's like, hey, want me to tell you about how I beat that phony psychiatrist a few weeks ago? But this Say the what? beginning of the issue was later that night because he got back from the study date with Liz. But now it's like the next day, but it's supposedly like weeks later. And, and, and even in the next panel, Connie, like the one who was going to tell on Liz, like says, I told you they had a date last night, so – they're breaking their own continuity within two panels. Or Flash is just dumb. Yeah, yeah I'll roll with that. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he, he sit his head on the football field. Well, like, he sees, line there. A few weeks. Oh, I, I mean last night, last night. Well, he sees Liz and Peter walking to school together, or Liz chasing Peter to school, either way. And Connie replies, see, I told you they had a day last night. <laughs> <laughs> Flash plays nice to Peter while Liz is around, but once she's out of earshot, Flash tells him, you and me after school. Peter is jumpy the whole day, and the classmates are all assuming that it's because of Flash's little challenge, but he's really paranoid that the Slayer is going to be coming after him. There's that one panel I like where he's uh, looking out the window at school, and Liz is like, Peter, why do you keep staring out the window that way? <laughs> what other way is there, Liz? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like uh, Jimmy Stewart and uh... yeah. that'll throw her off my scent for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the robot is activated, and Jonah sits at the control console, and his face appears on the screen. And the robot goes through the halls of the Daily Bugle, which confuses his employees. But at this point, they should be used to this type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the robot zeroes in on Spider-Man's uh, aura. Okay, and heads towards Midtown High. Peter sees the robot heading towards the school and runs off to change in the Spidey. But one of Flash's cronies sees this and tells Flash. And Flash and the gang chase after Peter, thinking that he's ducked out on the fight. Now, I just had to point out here that between Manhattan and Midtown High, Queens, there are no other spiders to distract the robot. Well, it's going after, like, I guess, like a giant spider. Spider Man's chi. This is like, you know, Miles. uh, Okay. (laughs) I love the kids like saying, let's teach him to duck out a flash officer. Come on, let's go after him. Yippee! Like, hooray, we're going to beat this boy senseless. <laughs> and I love Flash's face in the middle panel on the bottom when Liz is griping him out. He's like, this, this is something between Parker and me. Leave me alone. Mommy. Oh, but mom. <laughs> I want to kill Parker. Yeah. Yeah, well, Liz is Liz is with the angry students chasing Peter. She's not happy about learning of the fight, but she thinks that, you know, she should stick around. So Peter's being chased by the gang, and the Slayer is behind them chasing Peter, but it doesn't know that he's chasing Peter. It thinks it's chasing Spider-Man, but it can't see Peter. This makes sense, trust me. The kids see the robot and think that Jonah... <laughs> I like this one that's like... I love yeah, me too. <laughs> he's, he's turned into a monster. It's Jameson! Oh my god! 
the kids see the robot and Jonas turned into a monster as if this was like a tale of Jimmy Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen <laughs> the Jonah robot reveals that he's chasing Spider-Man which only makes Flash run faster like wow Spidey's here keep running guys Peter turns a corner really really fast and when nobody is looking broad daylight on a city street he does a flip onto the roof the robot follows his aura up there but Peter has changed <laughs> into Spider-Man just in time the robot introduces itself to Spider-Man. The chase is on. Oh, yes. I love this. He says in the style of Christopher Daniel Barnes, like, the, the, you won't escape me, Spider-Man. I can follow you wherever you go. Which reminds me of Shocker. <laughs> I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. The check's in the mail. In the mail, baby. Flash thinks he can help again, you know, because, I mean, he's Flash Thompson. He beat Blue Grid Reinhardt, didn't he? Or, <laughs> or he kind of, like, stuck around. Liz thinks that if she'll tag along, he'll stop being jealous of Petey. So Spider-Man lures the robot into the middle of the street, hoping for a very easy, very embarrassing, very public defeat. But he soon finds out that his webs are ineffective, and Spider-Man has to start running as the coils from the robot go out again. So whenever the robot gets close to Spider-Man, the coils come out. Betty tries have to stab him. Yeah, Betty tries to sabotage the machine from the bugle control room to help Spider-Man, but she isn't fast or clever enough. And, like, <laughs> her cover story's, like, really bad. She's like, oh, Mr. Jameson, this knob isn't working. Let me touch it for you. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> Brilliant. And it, it actually like, works as Jameson's like, no, no, don't. He's like, woman, move. Yeah. The Slayer chases, I'm calling it the Slayer. It's not called the Spider Slayer in the story, but this is, you know, they later call these robots the Spider Slayers. The Slayer chases Spider-Man up a tall building, voting how, unlike Spider-Man, the robot won't get tired. <laughs> Betty's first plan doesn't work, so now she tries to secretly, like, sneakily unplug the machine, and by pretending to trip and drop some papers near the electrical wire. And this is, like, the most exciting thing that's ever happened to her. She's, she says in her thought balloons, I feel like the heroine in an adventure thriller. It's really exciting. <laughs> Unplugging a machine. Oh, goodness. Oh, boy, you know. <laughs> it's it's just like I said last issue, you know, I guess I live a really dull life, Peter. Yeah. Oh, Pete, you know, Betty, you know, goodness, you know, don't overexert yourself here. Well, this doesn't work once again because she's not fast enough and Jonah sends her home without pay. He kicks her out of the, it's like, get out of here. And, like, and then oh, she's no. like, and then what, what was it that, what is it that she says? She's like, if this were just a story, I'd have made it. Right. But you didn't. If this were a comic book. <laughs> So Betty, Betty's like really angry. And again, this is like some actually good character moments from him. She's going to call Peter. She's like, I'll phone him. I hope he's home. After all, this is all his fault. Tiss, the line's busy. Spider-Man has helped Peter many times in the past. Now it's his turn to repay the favors. He talked JJ into this. So he's got to find a way to talk him out of it. Oh, the line's still busy. Even though it's like, what, 10 seconds later? I never even liked Spider-Man or any silly costume adventure, but I can't help feeling sorry for him. And then Betty tries the phone again. <laughs> like, Betty, wait more than 30 seconds. After all, it isn't fair for a man to have to fight a tireless robot. That's <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote. <laughs> if, if, if only Peter could convince Jameson to, Trat, still busy. And then this is my favorite line. Perhaps his aunt is on the phone. A woman can talk for hours. I'll go over and get it myself. Family, nice. ladies and gentlemen, a feminist at his, at his finest. Well, it's like Betty Brand. She's like hating on her own gender. And I love <laughs> how this page has count them 12 panels. Yeah. I mean, how you couldn't get an artist to do 12 panels today if you broke his arm. Well, that's probably not the greatest way to get him to draw anything, actually, but... Um, <laughs> he's to break his arm. Yeah, so Flash and the gang have lost Spidey and Jonah, so Flash is ready to go after Peter again. And Liz does the whole, Flash Thompson, don't you dare! The more Flash she defends Thompson. him, the more I hate him! Yeah, I love that. Which is actually, like, a good, like, uh, reason for Flash to hate Peter. Like, you can see, like, you know, his girlfriend, who's always trying to jump his bones, the more she defends him, yeah, the more Flash <laughs> is going to hate him. Flash, I'm too. ashamed of you! If you hurt poor Petey, I'll never talk to you again. Oh, relax, Liz. I won't even lay a finger on that crummy book. I just want to get him to admit that he ran away because he's chicken. He's just too smart to waste his time fighting. The more she defends him, <laughs> the more I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> his face doesn't help his, his situation either. Yeah. The chase is on, and 
Again, he's running after the coils. He's not getting tired. And then we have the epic page. Everybody has gathered outside of Peter Parker's house. Hell the yes. Flash, Flash's gang and Betty Brands. Why is that little group gathered in front of Peter's house? And then Liz is breaking in front of Flash and the gang. Now you just wait here, Flash. I'll go see if he's in. And if he is, I'll warn him not to come out till Flash is gone. As Betty sees Liz, it's that blonde Liz Allen. So, Peter still sees her. And then Josh Bertoni says, and you're still writing Ned Leeds. <laughs> and then we have, like, I love it when, when they do this. Like, the, the speech balloons where, like, there's the spikes at the bottom. Yeah, the girls like, are walking. The icy dribbles. Yeah, yeah the girls are walking cool. side by side. Well, fancy meeting you here, Miss Allen. Do you always travel in a pack like that? Well, I know, Miss Brandt, but sometimes it's hard to get rid of all my admirers. <laughs> Although I'm sure you don't have that problem. Ooh! Ooh! Girl. Girl. Ooh, girl. Like, from the next few panels, the girls, like, they're, like, trying to one-up each other to the point, like, they're shoulder, they're shoulder to shoulder together. Like, they're trying to knock the other one down. Look yeah. at panels, like, three and four. And it's really good because you can see, like, the art yep. is in a way where you can see, like, like the different designs of the girls, like, really... Really, it's like sometimes you can't tell Steve Ditko's yeah. people, but like you can tell like, the difference between Betty and Liz is not just the, it's not just the hair. It's like it's like the um the eyes and the nose and everything. It's, it's really good stuff. Yeah, th- and they're kind of mirroring each other. Like from panels uh panel three, panel four, and panel five, like, even panel uh, even the bottom panel. The last pa- yeah, the last panel. Liz just kind of has yeah. a little uh, divot on uh, in my copy. Yeah. In her, in her chair. Well, they go to the door, and Aunt May is very happy to see them for reasons she's hot. that we'll get into. Well, no, she's happy because she's showing off her, you know, her ringer. Oh, what a lovely surprise! Betty Brant and Liz Allen, do come in, my dears. Today seems to be a day for surprises. What does she mean by that? Is Peter in, Mrs. Parker? No, dear. He's out, although I expect him back shortly. Won't you come in and wait? Yes, I certainly will, thank you. And so will I. This is like the, high, the, like the volcano is like brimming. This is the height of all of this that's been building up over 25 issues. I know. It's like it's like they're one up in each other. She's like, I'll come in. And Liz is like, no, I'll come in. Well, I'll come in. For, well, I'll come in even better than you'll come in. It's so catty. I love it. And then the yeah, evil Aunt May has his face in the next panel. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like <laughs> your little dog too. Yeah, the, 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 this is this is the girl. This is my this is my friend. Now that you're here, I'd like you to meet another charming young lady. She's the, <laughs> she's the niece of Mrs. Watson, my next door neighbor. Another girl? More competition? Let me introduce you to the one, the only ginger. <laughs> yes, we have in this panel the epic first appearance of Mary Jane, but not her. Uh... Well, not epic, but it's not it's not a it's not a full facial. Mary Jane, this is Betty Brandt, and this is Liz Allen. Girls, I'd like you to meet Mary Jane Watson. She just dropped in to visit my nephew. Hello, <laughs> And uh, Mary Jane, we can't see her face, but we see her. She's wearing, um, you know, a dress, and she's sitting on the couch, and she has, like, what, what would you, a rag tied around her head so we can't yeah, she, see her she hair. Like she has, like, like a, like a <laughs> end of a bendle scarf. on her head. And her yeah, face like is obscure. Yeah, her face is obscured by a flower, so we can't see what she looks like. She has like, a very nice oh, figure, though. I mean, yeah, yeah, she has a nice figure, but oh, Liz and Betty can see what she looks like. <laughs> we get the reaction shot, and the girls like have gone from like you know volcano killing each other to like shock. <clears throat> She's a friend of Peter's. She looks like a screen star. He's been hiding her from us. Our shy, bashful, studious Peter. This is some of like the best art Steve Rico's ever done. I love this panel where like oh. they have the exact same facial expression. These two girls, yeah. these two different people have the exact same expression. It's awesome. Mary Jane, victory, fatality. <laughs> yeah, no, this is like so, that Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane panel where like Lana and Lois are like shaking hands, like there's a new girl after Superman, and we're gonna have to join forces and like bury the hatchet in order to get rid of her. Or that it's have like you X, seen the X two, the last stand? Have you ever seen um the Family Guy skit Bigger Jaws? Uh, Peter comes up with like a movie where like Jaws and like the the like people who are trying to kill him in the first movie like they're fighting and then like a bigger Jaws shows up so like they have to team up with Jaws to fight bigger Jaws because they have a common. <laughs> en- oh no, we have a common enemy. We gotta work together now. <laughs> now then, would you girls like a nice refreshing cup of tea? Or- 
Uh, no thanks, Mrs. Parker. I really have to be going. Yes, yeah, so do I. I won't see Peter some other time. I think Betty's only going to get a drink. I want to insert my history with this page right here because this is one of this page is like burned into my mind. I'm sure it's burned into your minds too. But um, oh yes, cool. I, I I had the first twenty issues forever, and once upon a time I went over to somebody's house and they had some some sort of index that went through like you know cataloging Spider Man's um various issues and i wanted to read what happened after issue 20 so i was flipping through it and this entire page was reprinted beside the text that recapped issue 25 so even though i knew nothing else about this era um i knew about this page right here and betty brant's and liz allen's cattiness and and the flower eating mary jane's face and uh it was just like this big tease for storylines i had no clue about so it was really really cool yeah you don't see um I don't think you see Betty or Liz for the rest of the issue after they leave. Like, and if you look at like, they both forget about their uh, respective missions. And if you look at Betty's face um, on the next page, the third panel, and Liz's face, both of those girls, they're just like defeated. Yeah, yeah, they're like, Pew! like the fire's on out. They're, they're like, you know, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Let me just get, let me just go. Yeah, like there. you know, Betty doesn't care about Spider Man anymore, and Liz doesn't care about saving Peter from getting beat up because he's got like a hot girl behind the. <laughs> but no, uh, there was an appearance of Mary Jane before her first appearance. Like this surprised me because when I had um. When I got Essential Spider-Man number two, like, I remember flipping through the pages and I saw this. I was like, whoa, a Steve Ditko drawn Mary Jane appearance? And, like, this was, like, revolutionary for me. So the girls excuse themselves, you know, and Flash is waiting outside the house. Well, was he in? Where is he? And then the girls are still doing the caddy. He wasn't in. And I don't know where he is. Goodbye, Miss Brands. Goodbye, Miss Ellen. We shall meet again. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, um, this is the last time that the two meet for a long time. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. How long? Like the one, is it the Marv Wolfman run or is it after that? Uh, uh, before the Marv Wolfman run, I think. Well, I mean, she was at the, Liz was at Betty's wedding in the, uh, Len Wein run. I'd say, you know, sometime towards the end of the Conway run. Or, you know, uh, the beginning of the Len Wein run, they probably, like, came face. But, yeah, it's really weird because, like, we never found out, like, how they buried the hatchet or whatever, but... There's never been an issue where they're like, you know, hey, remember when we used to fight over Peter because we were both idiots? Yeah. There's never been an issue for that? Not not to my knowledge. And, I mean, because I always wondered, like, you know, did Betty ever find out that Peter wasn't actually two-timing, you know, him with Liz? And what happened between Betty and Liz behind the scenes that Betty actually invited Liz to her wedding? It would be you a know. good it would be a good story idea for an untold tale. Oh wait, that series is done. Yeah, but they can do like a web. I mean, some Untold Tales Volume Two. Number I don't one. think it would support like its own story because you know, I mean, only people like me or you would be interested in that. But, and to make things even weirder, you know, when Betty um, was having marital problems with Ned and Marvel Wolfman's run, she was actually staying with Liz. They were roommates. Oh yeah. Hell, to be a fly on that wall. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, Betty and Liz take off, and then the rest of the gang actually takes off too, because they're getting bored of this. They're like, okay, Flash, this was fun for a while, but Flash is stubborn. He's gonna, he's gonna stick around. He because suddenly... um, Flash is a little bit of um, sort of, I don't know, OCD or. Well, I mean, you know, he's like obsessed with Peter the way that uh, Jonah's obsessed with Spider Man. It's kind of a parallel there. Well, Spider-Man can no longer run. The robot catches him in his coils, and Jonah gloats, gloats, gloats. He thinks that he's going to be offered a spot in the Avengers. (laughs) Well, American Son was, so you never know. Yeah, well, yeah, Harry Osborn, like, said in the first issue, I was a member of the Avengers for crying out loud. I was like, yeah, he was. That's really weird. So Jonah and Smythe leave the control panel to find the robot so they can unmask Spidey. So they take a cab, and they have a little tracker that's telling them where the robot is. While they're gone from the viewing screen, they can't see Spider-Man. So he comes up with a plan uh, to open up the robot's, like, belly and to mess with its control panel. And I love Jonah's dialogue uh, as he's coming up this, this day, the ladder to this roof. This will be a day the poets will write ballots about. In <laughs> fact, the president will no doubt proclaim it as J. Jonah Jameson Day. Or Terry Hillman Day. Look at him struggling like a rat in a trap. It's a sight to treasure for all the golden years to come. As he sees, <laughs> what as, he, as he struggles, as he sees Spider-Man struggling in the robot's coils. And now at last to tear off your mask and finally see what? Hey, what what's this? As he tears off the mask to see the head of <laughs> Nobody? Smith Smith says, Mr. Jameson, what have you done to his head? I didn't do any he hasn't got a head. Oh 
What am I saying? <laughs> and Peter has a strange like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, the reason why the Spider-Man's moving is because Peter's using his webs as kind of puppet strings on the roof. He was able to turn the robot off, you know, changing the Peter Parker. Uh, I don't know where he got his clothes, but okay. <laughs> and he keeps them in a pocket in his cape. And yeah, and basically set the whole thing up. Peter I have to say this the- is one of those things that like you know doesn't hold water as soon as you look at it twice because there's no way he could have a three dimensional puffed out suit fighting against those coils. For, and yeah. just be controlling it on strings from the roof. That just doesn't work. Yeah, Peter takes some pictures to chuckle over in his old age. Mary Jane leaves the Parker household with her head still obscured by a scarf and her head's to the side so you can't see the front of her face. And Flash Thompson is bedazzled by her beauty. But his mind is still on Peter. Like, he sees this hot girl and he's like, wow, who's that chick? Maybe she knows where Egghead is. Flash will later wind up dating Mary Jane for a brief period, so. After he hits puberty. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So a, a cop basically tells Flash, hey, some people are calling saying that there's like a suspicious guy wandering around the neighborhood. So, yeah, you got to take off. And he's like, oh, it must be that Parker. He's behind <laughs> us. I'll get him. I'll get him one day. <laughs> Peter comes home and demands food from Aunt May. And this is how you can tell Aunt May's pissed because she says, you can have something to eat later. Right now I want to have a serious talk with you. And Peter Red says, whoa, it must be serious. You're always trying to get me to eat more. What's wrong? That, young man, is what I want you to tell me. What do you mean? I went up to tidy your room after Mary Jane went home and... Mary Jane? What was she doing here? I wanted you to meet her. But that can wait. (laughs) This is... I know, it's like, it's so important that like... This is more important than meeting Mary Jane? That's been her only driving character point for ten issues. Know, nothing's more important than that. What did she possibly... Oh, she has a Spider-Man suit. She doesn't want Peter to eat. She doesn't want... Yeah, spoiler alert, she's holding a Spider-Man suit. <laughs> this is more important. I happen to find this behind the bookcase. I'm like, my extra Spider-Man costume. I gotta think of something fast. Oh, that old thing. I can explain that. I'm waiting, Peter. I've gotta find a way to clear myself without lying to her. Okay. Are you serious? You're going to try to do that? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it, it, it's just a disguise, Aunt May. I was going to use it to fool some people. Look, you can see it haven't even been worn. It's brand new. I've never even had it on. Gosh, you, you can't suspect me of being Spider-Man. Look under my coat sleeves. No costume. Well, now would he ever go out without it? Peter Parker, you silly boy. Of course you're not Spider-Man. Uh, so far, I haven't actually told an untruth. This what? Way. You always lie to her. What? He says... This one you care. What? <laughs> I've always had but a problem. Every, every time I ever read it, I'm like, always like, like, this is such crap. But I don't want you wearing that silly costume to any parties. It might get you in trouble. So I'll just take it with me. And there's a cake for you in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, so he gets to eat after all. Oh, she's gone. Boy, what a close shave. She must never discover my secrets. At her age, the shock could be fatal. Hope you're not tired of hearing that, folks, because you'll hear it only another time. Yeah. But I'm in the clear again for now. All in all, things didn't work out too badly, except that I become a superhero without a costume. Uh-huh. What if I have to become Spidey again soon? Oh well, I'll worry about that when the time comes. And the next issue. And unless we miss our guest, that time is coming sooner than Peter thinks. But you'll learn about it for yourself when you read our sensational next issue. Don't miss it. It's your kind of yarn. Okay, I gotta, I gotta say something. The second to last page. This, this is what bothers me about just characterization in general with, with comic books. Smythe says, oh, this is most annoying. Oh, well, back to the drawing board. So he really doesn't care about being Spider-Man or anything. He, he honestly kind of just did this, you know, to, to occupy his time. So he's not a bad guy. And then the next time he sees him, he's not a bad guy. The next time he has a Spider-Slayer, he's like the most insane, diabolical son of a bitch you'd ever see. Wanting to get Spider-Man because he humiliated him and everything. It's like, you know, where did that come from? I mean, don't, don't, you, don't you guys agree that this is like a big, well, it will be a big turn between like, you know, oh, well, back to the drawing board, ha, 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 to Spider-Man humiliated me. I must get my revenge. Bah, 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 bah. Well, maybe by yeah, that time he, the radiation was eating into his brain. Yeah, he's not the least bit agitated by this. He's like, huh? Oh, well, you win some, you lose some. Derp, 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 derp. <laughs> Going back to the beginning and, and looking at notes on page three, he makes a Joan Crawford reference. And I've actually seen one of her movies, even though, you know, she was already an old actress by the 60s. She was in Grand Hotel in 1932, uh, which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture, and I saw that. So that was, that was a good movie. Oh, I've, I've seen her. She was in a, a, my mom's favorite movie, um, Whoever Having a Baby Jane. 
play. Oh, yeah. What do we want to read into this Norman Osborn reference here? Well, Dicko uh, supposedly plod this, and Dicko has said that he would drop Norman in, like in that little rent that he did uh, a while ago online, that he dropped Norman in as him. So I can't think of any conceivable reason why. I, I think that this was deliberate, because why so else? Is this the next issue drop on the piers? Well, why else? Because I'll be honest, I used to think like that this Norman Osborn stuff was just a coincidence. You know, that, that like that when issue 25 came out, this was not meant to be the Green Goblin. This was just a stock character. But why on earth is that panel where it is? Oh, Jonah's talking to somebody. Oh, well, back to normal life. It's there for no reason. Well, I mean, like I said, it, like Goblin appears next issue. I mean, people, there are, there are times of foreshadowing where you, something seemingly not an, uh, unimportant, you know, is there for an un, yet unknown reason. I mean, I think, it's just, I think it was just to foreshadow the next issue. You know, now, without have anybody to, knowing it. Yeah, I have to wonder, because, like, you know, with the Scorpion, you know, they have the fact that Matt Gargan is tailing uh, Peter, and they have this, you know, shadowy figure uh, that's going to be, you know, the the big next bad guy. And they get to issue 20, and the first thing they do is acknowledge that J. Jonah Jameson was a shadowy figure, and then write it off as unimportant, and go up a, go a different direction with the plot. So I'm wondering if they had this here... He says, don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of your ad personally, and I'll see you at the club tonight. So I'm wondering if they thought that that was going to be a plot piece for the next month, and then when they got to the next month, it, they just, it didn't fit into what they came up with, so they dropped that idea. It's just such a non sequitur. I'm almost thinking that it had to be there for a reason. And if Dicko hadn't said that he purposely did this stuff, because I could see Stan lying about it. I can't see Dicko, because Dicko's not like you know a publicity hound. So if Dicko says that, then I'm inclined to believe him. And it makes me look at this in a new light. Whereas years ago, I would have just thought that this was, you know, a random thing for the sake of being random. Right. Mm. Now, I definitely think Norman's insertion here is intentional. I'm just wondering what the context was intended to be. Just so that he's always lurking in the background. <laughs> yeah, e- <laughs> either way, it had to be something. Because when whenever they point out something that obvious, I mean, they, they tip their hand pretty heavily on this one. It's I funny because, I mean, he, they're, they're, they're throwing it in your face. Must be someone important. JJ's smiling. And, you know, there's still no reason to think that it's actually Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin. Yeah, I mean, if the, if it, if it, there wasn't a point that they might as well just had a panel of, oh, look, you know, there's a dancing iguana with, you know, uh, leather shoes. Oh, well, back to back Or it to could just be David Lynch doing some really weird stuff. Yeah. Very well could be. It could be a blue rose, and no one will know why. First Spider Slayer and first Smythe, but we don't hear the word Spider Slayer in the story. Um, I, I didn't look over carefully, but it, unless I missed one, they just call it Robot. And Smythe is just called Smythe. He's not Spencer Smythe yet until one he introduces of the next himself day. as Hi, I'm Smythe. Yeah, really, just just Smythe. Yeah, just Smythe. I mean, Spencer, uh, uh, no, no, it's just Smythe. Smythe. Just yeah. Smythe. Gerard, um, I know you're a big Spider Girl fan. Did you read the Spider Girl crossover with this issue ever? No, I um, no, I've heard of the. And one of, like, the first, like, in the first volume of Spider-Girl, there's a story where Spider-Girl's, like, fighting a time traveler or something, and he takes her back in time to, like, issue 25 of Amazing Spider-Man. So she has to fight the Spider-Slayer, too. And she oh, goes cool. over to the... Yeah, she goes over to the house and meets Aunt May. And when she comes back later in the issue, it's it's during the Mary Jane scene. So, like, Betty and Liz are like, a, a f- another girl? A fourth girl? What? More competition? <laughs> Even though it's his daughter, but... Oh, I, I, I gotta be honest, I have, I've missed most of the early Spider-Girl stories, so... <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I recommend looking at it. It's really interesting, and it plays with a lot of the Silver Age tropes. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. DeFalco's usually on his, on his ball with that stuff. So on page 10, whenever he's describing the robot, and bring up the page here, Okay, Jonah and Spencer are both glare, uh, gloating over the video screen, and Jonah says, You are right, Smythe, your robot works. It found that roof-crawling menace as easy as pie, and it will defeat Spider-Man just as easily. It's equipped with every type of fighting device I could think of. Including and more I'm, coils and more coils and more coils. Yeah, because I'm like, where's the bazooka? Or the, to- <laughs> the Tommy gun? I, there's not even or, a James Watt. Or, or, or the butterfly PCA. knife. Well, yeah, it was funny. He, it's like, either, yeah, either way, guns, you know. <laughs> like he would, he would grab Spider Man, you know, hold him with the coils, and then like slowly zoom in as a knife came out of the mirror or something. 
<laughs> the cat, Jonah guts to the roof and like spider ends the kid. What the heck, Smythe? I just want to unmask him. Isn't it great? Spider-Man's been torn limb from limb. Dude, you, you are a sick SOB. I just want him unmasked. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a spider catcher. It's a spider slayer. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, maybe that's why they didn't call him spider slayers at this point. And actually, like, Jonah would later marry a spider slayer scientist. Not Sm- not Smythe, though. <laughs> Unfortunately, that would be Marla Madison. <laughs> Marla Madison. She built some Spider Slayers in Len Wein's run. Am I the only one that thinks that, that design for that Spider Slayer is really lame? Like, just the, it, it's it's like it looks like a bow-legged, oh no, genetically deformed version of Bender from Futurama. <laughs> you were you were one among many who think that this design is lame, dude. Yeah, really I mean, this is one of the silliest things ever. That's why every single Spider Slayer appearance since has like made the designs more. Crazy. If you compare this to like the one that uh, Michelinie and Bagley did in the '90s, which they adopted for the '90s cartoon, it, it like it's completely different things. The Black Widow. That's how I'm. That's, that's what, my master work is done. Now on page don't, 11. Don't worry. Those seekers were only meant to locate Spider-Man, not catch him. Then whose job is it, gentlemen? The Black Widow. <laughs> awesome. On page 11, Flash Thompson suddenly goes blonde instead of redheaded or whatever he is. And uh, I just think it's cool because it's like you know a spider sidekick. It's a it's a it's a plot direction they didn't pursue, but you know what if they had played with this for a couple of issues? Uh, I don't I don't know if I would like that if he were like routinely help Spider Man out. Not well, routinely, he, just like do it like a couple in, times and show that it doesn't work. Been in the vicinity of Spider Man like while something's happened and then like take the credit for it. <laughs> and I like the, I do like the Teflon Spider Slayer where the webs just don't stick to him. Yeah. So um, we get some foreshadowing to one moment in time here. Oh, yeah? Once, well, because Spider-Man's talk, you know, he's, I ought to reward Peter. I'll let him call me Jonah. And Spider-Man's thinking, I ought to reward Peter, too, with a brick. <laughs> oh. 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 I, I was hoping it would be, like, a really light thing that I would just floss over, but no, it had to involve that. <laughs> so the reason why Peter missed his wedding was because, like, he told Jonah to use the Spider Slayer robots <laughs> back in issue 25. This was all planned from the beginning. Um, Jonah it's sings a ser- flying trap. serial novel, and in serial storytelling, you have to know exactly how you're going to end it when you start. <laughs> Jonah sings flying trapeze uh, when he's going after Spider-Man, and Spider-Man sung that a few times in the Deco run, and Spider-Man even acknowledges, wow, do I sound that bad when I do this? So uh, I, I like how they kind of turn that little formula around. And this is one of those times that I'm definitely glad this is a uh, comic book and not like a television show, because I would not okay. want to hear Jonah Jonah's dulcet tones. If those were there, the greatest of ease. So Betty's... um. You know, Liz Allen jealousy aside, she's willing to almost get herself fired or sent home without pay from her job to help Spider-Man. And it, she's, you know, going after Peter, trying to make him man up and help spy. Like, that's actually like, I can actually get behind Betty this issue. I'd get behind Betty. No, but yeah, it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> Although, well, I don't know, man. It, was it me or was Betty involved a lot of slapstick in this story? I thought that was weird. <laughs> Like, of all the characters to use for, like, you know, Three Stooges-style physical comedy, Betty Brant would not be the first one I think of. Well, it's funny because, like, the, the, the panel where she's, like, tripping over the thing, she's like, whoops, well, <laughs> that was, sure was an accident, wasn't it? Like, I, I don't know what Stanley, I don't know what was going through Stanley's head when he did this, but uh, he was really, like, trying to pad this thing out with that. Or whenever she's roughing with Peter at the beginning and he's, like, fighting her off. Yeah, I mean... And again, this whole retcon that, you know, Betty just hated Spider-Man so much and she couldn't... St- I mean... She's trying to help him here. She says she doesn't really like him that much, but it's not like, you know, in issue 280. Yeah, it's two, issue 289 where Peter David's having Ned Leeds say, I remember Betty waking up in the middle of the night having nightmares screaming Spider-Man's name. Um, yeah, not so much. Maybe she developed issues later. I don't know. Yeah, no. Uh, the writers developed issues later. <laughs> again, it's it's. <laughs> they, I mean, I, it, it, there's like even that Tom DeFalco source book where it's like after Spider-Man got involved in the death of Betty's brother, uh, Bennett, you know, Betty never forgave Spider-Man and slowly Peter and Betty drifted apart. It's like there's this alternative history that's different than what's been said. I, I, I see that. I say this almost every episode, though. <laughs> in case it's, yeah. this is listeners first first episode listening. It's every yeah. episode of somebody's first, right? I have a friend who just listened to Twelve yesterday. So, well, like it's again because it's like they beat our head into it. This issue, like Betty doesn't really, you know, she's not only indifferent to Spider Man, she's trying to defend him. She doesn't hate him, so I mean, it is worth bringing up. Yes, but this issue basically has everything in it. I mean, it has 
Jameson, you know, an adversary, Aunt May, Betty and Liz, Flash. I mean, is there, is there, is there anything in, the, in this his, in the Spider-Man history so far that's missing from this issue? I mean, it has it all. No, th- this issue is, is like a culmination of every spider plot thread is brought into play in the course of this story. It's really, really awesome in that respect. I mean, the design of the Spider Slayer is silly, but just about every other aspect of this story, in my opinion, is really awesome. No, it's I mean, you, it's really classic. Gerard, you said earlier you didn't really care for this issue. What what are some of the problems you have with it? Well, primarily, I just I can't get behind this spider slayer. I mean, it's supposed to be like the ultimate spider hunting weapon, and it's just some dumb looking robot with like rape tentacles. I don't I don't get it. Like, why, <laughs> why, why is that the most da- like he's faced more dangerous foes within like the last I don't know five issues, let alone this. Thing. In its I mean, defense, I think that it wasn't really hyping up the the slayer. As it was hyping up, somehow, J. Joe Jefferson catches Spider-Man, you know. It may not be great, but somehow he does it. But that's an even worse part of it, because Jameson's face is plastered on that thing the whole time. It just looks really dopey. I, I, I find it hard to take that thing seriously. But then again, you know, the more I look at this issue, the more I realize <laughs> this is just, like, the broad comedy issue. So, I this, mean, like, I, I think I was not it's lighthearted. I mean, I mean Spider-Man's not even really all that danger. I mean, yeah, people, spider Jameson might unmask him, but I mean, it's not like he's gonna like get shot or something or fall off the building. Also, <laughs> I gotta be perfectly honest with you, that climax makes no sense. <laughs> oh, it does not. <laughs> oh, with him getting out of the tentacles? That's why I love it. No, I was just thinking about that. How like you know, okay, so if he turns off the device and the tentacles retract, and let's say he manages to get out of his costume and get into his civvies somehow, and then he turns the robot back on to grasp the spider suit, it would, it would just grab him again. Yeah. Yeah, he must have done that like in like a Super Saiyan or Super He Saiyan. must have like Super rewired Saiyan. it so that it wouldn't grab him or something. I don't know. And then the tentacles are, are pulling on the spider suit. The spider suit is visually struggling. And yeah, he's pulling it with wires, but it's fabric. If there were any tension being placed on it at all, it would collapse. It's not going to keep a body. It's shape. so funny because like like once like the second you see like them turn around and it's like what, and then you see Peter you're like ha ha ha. Every time that, like I read this, even though I know it's coming, I'm like, "What the heck? Like, like what, what happened there? Like, like, are you are you serious?" And, and Jonah, look up. <laughs> <laughs> For crying out, and, I mean, and he doesn't wear his clothes under his Spider-Man clothes. So how'd he get his blue suit back? Like oh, I said, it's in a pocket in his cape. He doesn't have yeah. it. Okay, okay sure. <laughs> I'll, 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 why not? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. He has Flash's uh, ring. <laughs> well flash thompson is pretty close by so yeah <laughs> this is jonah at his finest though like the jonah comedy which was a very big you know hallmark of the stanley steve dicko stuff this is jonah at his most hyperbole his you know uh-huh. the poets will write ballads about this i'll be yes to join the avengers it'll be j jonah jameson those, day those last few pages where spider-man is actually struggling and not the costume the look especially like on page 18 like the, the top the second panel jameson's face is like <laughs> it's good stuff. It is good stuff. I- I've compared this to a Benny Hill chase sequence because you have Flash chasing Peter, Liz chasing Flash, trying to get him not to chase Peter, the robot chasing Spider Man, Betty chasing Peter. It's like everyone's chasing everyone. They're all running in this. It's like a Benny Hill skit. There's a lot of movement in the issue because Betty and Liz, like once they drop out of the chase, they both hot, hot uh, you know, they both hoof it to a. Uh, on May's house, and then they both, you know, kind of leaving over. Like, there's, there's a lot of movement everywhere with all the characters. Now, I'm thinking back to the last few times that Jameson has gotten involved with a villain like Mysterio or Craven. And at some point, I want to say it was the Craven story issue 15, he gives Craven a lecture about not breaking the law. <laughs> and then he made the scorpion. And now he's following a spider slayer. And well, I, even before well, then, he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, ro- I'm robbing him, I'm blind. He's worth more than I'm paying him, but I deserve it because he's a fool. I mean, Jameson. <laughs> Jameson's not a well, good guy. Well, it, it, is the Spider Slayer really doing anything illegal at this point? It's yes. assaulting Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah like, you, but... you, can't just grab, you can't just grab somebody and then like, unmask them. Like, we've, we've established before in other shows that you know you can't unmask somebody without legal precedent. I am not allowed to just walk up and grab somebody on the street. That is. Nuts. But if there's a war- if that person is a vigilante and there's warrants out for their arrest... Uh, I don't know what the laws are in civilian arrest. But um, <laughs> this is a glorified citizen's arrest. Yeah, citizen's arrest. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, 
<laughs> that, reminds, that reminds me of Paul Blart Mall Cop, where like he's like, "Well, I'll make a citizen's arrest on you," and then that woman's like, "So anyone could do that. I'll call citizen arrest you." Yeah, you get you get into sticky situations because if you mess up, you you could easily become under charges yourself for assault and, and that sort of thing. So. Oh, Jonah can pay off any lawyers, you know. That's true. He has to later, doesn't he? Yeah, he knows that Spider Man doesn't have a leg to stand on. But yeah, you know, you have Aunt May discovering the I, this view. This is a culmination of a lot of stuff and lots of plot. I mean, the only things that are really missing off the top of my head are like Frederick Foswell is not mentioned and is nowhere to be seen, and the oh, Ned okay. Leeds thing is not brought up. But uh, but no, no, those, those are kind of fleeting compared to everything else. Yeah, like uh, uh, they drop a lot of stuff into the issue. A lots of things come to head. This is. I mean, I think continuations of the Mary Jane and Norman Osborn plot. Yeah, and when we actually see Mary Jane, which I mean, I think that this is this is like a very big deal. I always thought that Mary Jane was dressed weird, and I get that like the scarf was there so that way you wouldn't see her hair. But I I cannot imagine like what kind of a teenage girl would wear a scarf around her head like that. that, that she... I I don't think there's really any explanation for that. Just it's just because of Steve Ditko, Mr. Conservative guy. You know, oh, I'll, I'll put I'll put a, a handkerchief over this woman's head. <laughs> Well, it's like they're trying to say that, like, she's super conservative because, like, you know, this is Aunt May's, like, choice for Peter and Aunt May's super conservative or something, which obviously does not wind up being the case. <laughs> and I have problems. I mean, even the dress. I mean, I might be able to see Mary Jane in a dress like that, but but probably not. That page is so classic just to look at. I don't, I don't even really have any words. For We're really it. gushing over this page. We don't, like, this, this is nothing compared to her next appearance. But this is this is like one of the most iconic moments of the first forty issues of Spider Man. Of the Dicko run, I think it is. But I mean, the lead up to it is so brilliant, where they're like so catty talking to each other and stuff, <laughs> and then they're like pushing each other to get into the door, and then they run in there and they're like, <gasps> and they have nothing to say. Yeah, and look at and and on that page, look at Aunt May on panel six. Oh, she is smug. She's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You two think you stand a chance? <laughs> she <laughs> Let really me introduce is. you to a friend of mine. She is smug. She's like, yeah, have some tea. You know, I'm not threatened by you at all. This is my ace in the hole. And they've been teasing Mary Jane since when? When did she get her first mention? Was it was issue it, 15? Uh, issue 15, issue, 10, issue, 15. 10 issues. 10 issues ago. So for 10, 10 issues. months, they've been teasing this chick. And now, you know, they bring her on the, on the screen and we don't get to see her. And I just think it's, it's, it's genius that they hide the face and everyone else gets to see her. Everyone else is gobsmacked at her beauty. And it, 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 it's heightened by, you know, the history we know the character has. If we were talking about this in 1978, we probably wouldn't give two flips about it. Uh, well, 78 we would, but not, like, you know, during well, that I time. Mean, I, yeah, I, I compare it to, like, where she is much later as, as Peter's um, wife. wife but, um, or, or, or non-wife or unwife or whatever. I don't want to think about it. But, you but, know, one thing, one thing that's really I'm really curious about, though, do you guys, because you guys are the experts, I guess. <laughs> do you as guys are you. Think, did, yeah, man, you're, you're among the alumni. Do you think Ditko had a design for Mary Jane? Oh. Do you think that he had an appearance for her, uh, like, thought of or anything like that? Well, she I, she appeared, like, soon after the Norman Osborn thing was resolved, and Ditko maintained that they were going to do that. It, it just it was just half a sense that he quit before that happened, so it's possible. I mean, how, how often did he do these scripts before they were published? He, Whenever, maybe he planned ahead, because Ditko obviously planned Norman Osborn ahead, so... Whenever mm-hmm. John Byrne left Superman in 1988, they spent the next couple of years spending a lot of time tying up his plot threads or taking his plot threads and turning them in new directions. There was a lot of, you know, let's resolve the John Byrne stories that have been set up. And obviously, people planned their comics out in advance a lot more in the 80s than they did in the 60s. But do you think that... The, the Norman Osborn, Peter Parker unmasking and finale of that battle and the Mary Jane appearance and her hooking up with Peter Parker. Do you think those were all playing out plans that had already been made with Steve Ditko? I doubt it. I think that they were planning things issue by issue at that point. They may have had like, oh, well, maybe here we'll introduce Mary Jane, but not like to the point we're going to introduce Mary Jane. They're going to have dinner. He's going to leave to go fight Rhino. No, not, not yeah. that detailed, but just the notion that they planned to do it. That well, remember, Lee, and, like, Lee and Dicko also weren't talking for at least a year before he actually left. Yeah, and, I mean, that I, might I know that. Mentioning right here, even though its next issue is exactly the one year mark, this is as good a place as time as any to say we're basically at the one year mark before Lee, before Steve Ditko leaves the book. 
Ramita said in an interview that when it came time for him to draw Mary Jane in her first appearance, he didn't know how to draw her. So he went back and when he was trying to figure out what direction to go in, he looked at this issue and he saw that Flash, Betty and Liz all said, wow, she's hot. So he chose to make her a really attractive, bombastic woman. But the fact that Ramita had to think about, you know, what direction am I going to take this woman and how am I going to draw her leads me to believe that the plans weren't that concrete. Yeah, like, like, real quick, it's interesting because I, I, as I have the essentials, I, I literally see, like, on one page, uh, the, the appearance in this issue, and then the page where she appears again in issue 42, and obviously her clothes are different. They're, they're more, like, forward. They're, they look more like 70s clothes and 60s clothes. So you, you got to figure that if Joan Romita had to make her really, really stand out, then she had to look different than she does here. I mean, here she has a nice figure, but that's about it. I mean, he really had to, like, in, in a creative sense to... Uh, make her what she is in here and to, to the other characters. Well, her did, sleeves did, are really big on page 19. Look yeah. at her sleeves. You can fit like a cat inside of there. Ditko didn't work in the office, so if he had any design sketches, they would have been in his in his apartment or wherever it is that he worked. So I doubt that any of those ever came to light. Because whenever he left, whatever he had like up his sleeve just stayed there. He wasn't going to hand over that stuff. So maybe if they had been planning to introduce Mary, because I mean, you know, within a couple of issues, she's there. I don't know if they were planning that far ahead. Maybe he had a design, but he certainly wouldn't have handed it over with his last issue, which was 38. He wouldn't have handed that in with, along with that. So I don't know. I, I tend to go back and forth. I have to imagine if they were putting her into the stories at this point, he must have had a design or at least an idea of a design somewhere. I, I, I just feel like I really would at some point we would have loved to see what that looked like. Because I, I guarantee it was radically different from what she ended up being. Uh, it, it's but, uh, like the dialogue for Mary Jane and the way she looks is like two different things. Like, she's drawn, like, basically like, you know, Aunt May as a teenager, you know? She's, like, wearing these dowdy clothes and a rag over her head. So, but then, like, everyone's saying, wow, she's hot, but... No, see, I, no, see, I think, okay, you and I are thinking of two totally different things with his outfit. To me, she looks like a girl in a night, a woman in a 1960s film. Exactly. Uh, I, who, you know, picture her with sunglasses. You know, she she's out and about, and I, I can visualize a woman just like this being a beautiful woman in a 1960s film. Exactly. Yeah. Same. So I, I don't think it's so much of a rag on her head as a decorative headscarf, which is which was a fashion at the time. Yeah, the headscarf sunglasses combo was like a movie star thing. Mm-hmm. So, but it's, yeah, it's, it's totally it's not. To, it's even alluded to in the line. She looks like a screen star. That, that's what I got the impression. I mean, it's, it's not like she's dressed like Aunt May was in Peter's hallucination where he thought that she was selling shoelaces. It's not like it's <laughs> that bad. <laughs> now, it's, it's not in line with her later appearance and Ramita's design for her. Well, but... I, think, I think it was Josh who said it. Like, the dialogue is another thing, too, because. When, when Mary Jane becomes a supporting character, we're going to never shut up about her dialogue. It's so, it's so oh, dated boy. in the 60s. But here, oh, yeah. it's, it's just it's just kind of like, you know, kind of, you know, it's it's not, it's, it's like, oh, hi, girls, hi, la, 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 bye, Mrs. Parker. But it's not like, you know, uh, bye, hun, like she, or anything she would say, like, to anybody. It, it was actually, like, the Ramita uh, Mary Jane. And even though everybody, like, comes up to Peter and says Mary Jane's hot, he still doesn't, like, get the message. Because like yeah. Betty says, the next issue she's pretty hard to miss, and Liz says at gradu and Liz kind of like alludes to it at graduation. And he's like, I, I had no idea who you're talking about. I've, I've never seen this woman. But I hope she isn't ugly. <laughs> this is just a fun issue, you know. There's some plot holes. I mean, the spider beam, you know. Really, I guess they fixed that in the essentials for that very reason. They sure this was did. this was reprinted. Um, late '90s, early 2000s. Like they did like a like an issue of Spider Man during the reboots where like it dealt with every single spider slayer coming back. Cause Smythe just went crazy. His son, Alistair Smythe, cause the Smythe thing's a legacy now. And like they had three, they had like a few Spider-Man store slayer stories in there. They had this one and it was like reprinted and recolored. And I think that they had issue 192 also the one where, uh, sp- this Smythe, Spencer Smythe actually winds up dying. And it's a really what good issue. Reasons? Cause he like, he handcuffs Jonah and, uh, Spider-Man together. Mm-hmm. With a with Ever a bomb, heard. and it's like done a lot like longer than it was in the animated series, where like Jonah gets let off of the bomb like at the beginning of the episode. Would this be but, around like the year two thousand, the uh, number twenty of the second series, Howard Mackey that, and Eric Larson? Yes, that that's exactly it. Okay, but yeah. but do you guys agree with me? Like like my rant on Smythe, how 
he's just a nice guy. I mean, he's, you know, oh, I, I can help you be Spider-Man. Oh, that didn't work out? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'll see you later. Peter stops to see him a few issues later, and like yeah, it's... like the graduation issue. But like when on the when Ramita's on the book, he's like a raving lunatic, and, and that yeah, that really does annoy me. I mean, because not every bad guy has to be a bad guy, you know. So right. I thought it was realistic that he was just a you know a, a, a unassuming scientist, but then he well, comes back. Well, then again, Ramita changed a few characters. I mean, <laughs> Gwen Stacy, anybody? Gwen Stacy, Ned Leeds, Flash, Todd, like everyone, like you know, like took a chill pill when Ramita came on. Except for Smythe, he took, he took like he took like steroids and like yeah. But I, I do I do see your point, Don, because in this book, Smythe is not the bad guy. Jamie Jones no, is he, the bad guy. Smythe invents a robot, but we almost get the sense at the end that this was like just some big scientific experiment. He was just trying it out to see if he could. It wasn't an actual effort to do anything malicious. Right, and I, and I like that, and I wish that kind of. Uh, I mean, he'll, he'll, it's it's interesting because he's like, he'll be the only uh, the other scientist besides Connors who's a good guy. And that's, that's, that's always, always sort of seemed like a missed opportunity to me. But So the spider's web this month starts with a letter from Flo Steinberg. Apologizing profusely for running a letter twice. And if only she could see the book today. Because, you know, <laughs> Steve Wackard, sorry buddy, but you've rerun so many letters in the last couple of years. Do y'all read the letters columns in the Spider-Man books these days? Not yeah. anymore. I, I used to when I was younger, but now I, I don't read. Yeah. He, 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 he ran one... I want to say three times. It was at least twice. And then he apologizes for it and says he's, you know, always under a tight schedule and sometimes things slip his mind. And uh, to close out the letters column, here's another interesting piece of mail we got. And he runs the letter again. So it's well, kind of laughing at himself. Joke. Yeah, that was a joke, the third one. But, <laughs> but, but he, before that one, he had also rerun other letters. Flo is just like, she writes in a letter herself to apologize to the fans for doing it just once. But uh, then again, she's not, you know, editing a, a weekly Spider-Man book. I no, but that... wasn't she, like, helping edit, like, all the titles at the time? Yeah. And if Steve, like, wrote in a letter to himself every time he rewrote a book, then he would end up rewriting his own letters by mistake. Yeah. He's too, uh, he's too busy explaining what we're supposed to think about the characters in the letter column. He can't be bothered to make, make sure the letters are running properly. Yeah, my favorite was when he said that Spider-Man's supposed to be a romantic comedy. I'm like, <laughs> really? So this is, like, Wedding Crashers or you, me, and Dupree? Mm-hmm. But not to bad mouth. In ten days. But no, maybe just a little bit, but in good fun. Oh boy. So Flo Steinberg, good on her. <laughs> There's a letter from South Africa this time from Glenville Abrahams. The letter itself is not that interesting, but the, the fact country that, writes a letter. Yeah, from from Glenville Abrahams is not the country. I mean, he might be a big guy. I don't know. Well, you said like South Africa, as if like the you know the country like grew arms and like wrote a letter. Did you ever get a package from a location? Yes. All the time. <laughs> and Jim, okay, Busek, or maybe Buchek, says he Is has it? taken to comic book reading in order to relax from the strenuosity of college textbooks. And I'm not entirely sure that's a word. Uh, I'm not? entirely sure that's not a word. Strenuosity? The nature of being strenuous? But yeah, I don't I don't think it works that way. Strenu- yeah, it is a word, according to... Um... The free dictionary.com and merriamwebster.com and encyclopedia.com. Really? Well, I, it means intense it, intense energy. Interesting. Okay, well, you know. The next issue box of the letters column gives the standard we have no fracking clue what we're doing next month kind of a teaser. <laughs> At least they're honest. <laughs> Not like that <laughs> one issue. Like, if you think you haven't seen all the new villains, yeah, it's a. Not to this. <laughs> that was awesome. Actually, um, that is the kind of thing. That's that, that, that's the standard. We don't have a clue trailer that they do. It says our next issue is so utterly stupendous that we won't even attempt to describe it now. Nothing we can say will do it justice. All we'll tell you is no loyal web spinner would want to miss it. Even Stan and Steve plan to buy a copy, and they're already read it. That's Spider-Man number twenty-six, the ever-loving most. Till then, don't wrinkle your costume and face front. You got all those Stanley. I'm sorry. What is the next issue? Was the Crime Master one, right? Crime yeah, Master and Green Master Goblin, two parter. Bring okay. back my goblin to me. Okay. Yeah, no, th- I never got that title. The first ad this month has the X Men number eleven, soon to be featured on the X Men blog at AmazingSpiderMan.Lipson.com. Introducing the Stranger to the world of Marvel, and he will become eventually one of Marvel's cosmic movers and shakers, although probably one of the lesser of that group. Oh, I remember that. The Stranger, yeah. Is that the cover with the giant dude? <laughs> yeah, the giant dude with the long coat. 
He eventually gets this, like, shoulder pad costume, but here he's just, you know, wearing a lab coat. His X-Men appearances after this were few and far between, in any case. And Sergeant Fury 18, where they're fighting and somebody gets killed. <laughs> it's called Killed in Action, so I'm guessing that somebody gets killed in action. Sergeant Fury does. Not so- <laughs> <laughs> The second ad shows the Fantastic Four, number 39, a blind man shall lead them. Continuing the saga, the Fantastic Four have lost their powers and have to face Doctor Doom, and Daredevil helps them out. Apparently, that was an episode of the 1990s Fantastic Four cartoon, because they had Daredevil on there, and that episode was called, And a Blind Man Shall Lead Them. Yeah, I, I remember... It was the first um, episode, or first season, I mean. I remember, like, they have to use a robot for the thing... Yes, yes, they do. They use a robot for the thing. Yeah, uh, and like, and 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 thing gets mad again because like it's one of those things where like the only way to save the day is for him to think himself out again. Right. Oh, I'll always be a freak. Oh, what am I gonna do? The thing get mad and get out of town. On a similar note, if we're talking about issues being adapted into cartoons, Spider-Man Twenty Five was on the nineteen sixty seven cartoon. <gasps> oh, oh, the sixty seven cartoon pretty much cribbed all of their uh, plots from. Up from issues, right? Now, I've, I've only seen the first season, but there were very few actually that were taken from the uh, from the comics as far as you know, just percentage goes. I think there were I'm three. Guess, I'm guessing that they diluted it though, because like I can't imagine that they would have had like Betty and Liz and Flash and Mary Jane like all in there. No, none of that's there. Um, it's basically all of the Smythe stuff and the um, Betty in the office, like her trying to uh, push the button and pull the cord. <laughs> oh, it's like I'm in an adventure novel. Oh, I exactly. would have just made it. That's there. Of course, the only characters in that cartoon are Peter and Betty and J. Jonah Jameson. Nobody else is recurring. Well, as we've mentioned, you know, Spence Smythe will show back up. He'll get a first name. He'll get a son later on who will go from looking like comic book guy from The Simpsons with a butt yeah. crack showing to like this skinny sleeth, you know, like guy with a mullet. Really? Oh, yeah. Like, and he needs so much hilarity in the 90s cartoon. Yeah, in his in his first appearance, like look at look at a book that has Smythe, like look at his last appearance or something, and he's like you know this skinny muscular like action figure, but in his first appearance, he's this fat comic book like loser guy, and like he's really gullible because he captures Mary Jane thinking that Mary Jane's Spider Man because of Aunt May's hat that we mentioned earlier. And look, Mary Jane's, like, really able to manipulate him. She's like, well, how'd you get your powers? She's like, I got a stall for time. I got it from space aliens. Oh, of course. That's, that's the only thing that makes sense. There is also an ad for the Mary Mark Martin Society stating that in future the MMMS News will get its own page. And also, every single member would have his name printed in a comic. They're going to go through a whole bunch of lists of names in tiny, tiny print, different in every book that uh, um, came out that month. So it's, huh. it's so you'll have to buy every book to find your name. Exactly. want to give a thanks to Mr. Gerard Delatour for joining us tonight. If uh, sure. Gerard, you want to give a quick rundown on where they can see your uh, internet wisdoms? You can see my internet wisdoms at spidermancrawlspace.com for my amazing Spider-Man reviews. You can check out SpideyDude.com for our reviews and hopefully soon some upcoming interesting content. And, of course, you can listen to me on Clone Saga Chronicles, along with uh, two of the other three guys in here. Oh, yeah. Y'all are taking over my show. So, that brings us to the end of September. We have covered 25 issues of Amazing Spider-Man with 619 left to go. I want to thank Gerard Delatour one more time for being on Amazing Spider-Man Classics with us this week. Next, we have another special guest to help us commemorate the Green Goblin two-parter with the Crime Master. You can look forward to hearing Mr. J.R. Fettinger of the Spider-Man Crawl Space right here on Amazing Spider-Man Classics. That's episode 19 coming at you in about 10 days. Also in the month of October, we'll be getting up through issue 30. And the second annual, if you're the sort that likes to read ahead. And there's also a very, very brief cameo in Fantastic Four Annual Number 3 that we'll be giving a little bit of mention. I want to ask you what you think about the length of this show. I know it was a long one. And uh, the recordings that we've done of future episodes, it looks like the length is not getting much shorter. So let me know if it's too much for you. If I should be editing more rigorously. If the tangents go on too long. Or if you are very happy with the way things are going. 
My personal philosophy as a listener of podcasts is that the link doesn't really matter as long as it's entertaining, because I can always stop and come back to it later. But that's my opinion. It might not be yours. So let me know. The email for the show, if you want to write in about that or anything else, is AmazingSpidermanClassics at gmail.com. You can also drop a line on the Facebook page. Just search Amazing Spider-Man Classics on Facebook, and you can like us there. You'll get news about new postings as they go up, and also be able to uh, communicate with the guys on a regular basis. The show does have a website at AmazingSpiderMan.Libsyn.com, where I'll be posting images from each episode, such as an example of... Audrey Hepburn in a headscarf to show Josh Bertone that yes, you can wear a headscarf and be an elegant movie star looking kind of girl. And finally, of course, we always do welcome reviews on iTunes. Let us know how you feel about the show there. Let the world know how you feel about the show. On iTunes, just search Amazing Spider-Man Classics and subscribe to the show there if you like. So again, be on the lookout for the next episode in about 10 days. I'm going to try to do three episodes a month now that I'm all caught up to where I want to be. So be looking for us on October 10th, 20th, and 30th. And until then, I'm John Wilson, and with Josh Bertoni and Donovan Grant, we all thank you, as always, for listening to Amazing Spider-Man Classics. Good night. Just like flies, look out! Here comes the Spider-Man! Is he strong? Listen, bud! He's got radioactive blood! Can he swing from a thread? Take a look overhead! Hey there! There goes the Spider-Man! In the chill of night, at the scene of a crime, like a streak of light, he arrives just in time! Spider-Man! Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, wealth and fame, he's ignored, action is his reward to him. Life is a great big hang-up, wherever there's a hang-up, you'll find the Spider-Man. Donovan is my filter, by the way. Um, I use him for, like, you know, making me sure I don't... <laughs> hey, yep. That's a great filter to have, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've had several graphics I was going to put up on the website, and I was like, should I do this, Donovan? He's like, um, no. <laughs> there are some that are, that are a little, um, um, raunch scale, which is oh risque and raunch and combined. We'd like to welcome everybody, and, uh, see, this is what I do. I fiddle fart all over my introductions, and I edit it all out to make it look, sound good. With me in the studio tonight are, of course, our usual and Mr. Bertoni. When he calls me Mr. Bertoni, I feel a hundred years old. Still. <laughs> Again? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take it away, Josh. As I gulp down this ice cream. Oh, oh, oh. And the old man comes at you again. Yeah. Oh, no, it looks like he's leaving, thank God. He walked over to my table. He's like, you know, I know everything about writing and editing. And I'm like... Oh my god, I'm trying to do my best to ignore you. How, what? what, what? Writing an anime. And editing. Yeah. Uh, the spider signal! I better be on the move. It's like, she's like Chief O'Hare or somebody. <laughs> Peter's t- I'm like gulping down my ice cream in between like all you guys comment. See, why didn't you get your ice cream while Gerard was recapping? That's what I want to know. I didn't want ice cream then. <laughs> that Peter, t- Betty Brant. Oh my god. They just start playing the Spice Girls here. <laughs> they're doing wannabe I, I can't concentrate with wannabe this is okay I'm gonna try and keep a straight face we oh, found sucks. Josh's weakness <laughs> <laughs> Donovan you have two editing strikes against you oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gotta stop swearing huh? <laughs> <laughs> no actually son of a bitch works you can say that on um, TV so never mind you did say stuff dating grin earlier though so you get a yeah. you get a wrist slap for that but no son of a uh, bitch is fine the podcasting FCC.